Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions will come to order. Uh, today is a busy day, as we all know. Um, a very important vote is going to be taking place, and Republicans, Democrats will be meeting in their caucuses. So people are going to be coming uh, in and out. Uh, I also think that this hearing is important enough that we extend the time for questioning from the usual five minutes to seven minutes, if that's okay with folks. Um, let me begin by welcoming the CEOs of Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, Chris, Chris Berner, we thank you for being here. Uh, CEO of Merck, Robert uh, Davis, we thank you for being here. Uh, and the CEO of Johnson & Johnson, Joaquin Duato, for being with us this morning. Thanks very much. There is a lot of discussion uh, in our nation about how divided our people are uh, on many issues. And that is absolutely true. But on one of the most important issues facing our country, uh, the American people, whether the Democrats, Republicans, Independents, Conservative, Progressive, could not be more united. And that is the need to substantially lower the outrageous price of prescription drugs in this country. According to a recent poll, 82% of Americans say the cost of prescription drugs is too high, and 73% say that the government is not doing enough to regulate drug prices. As a nation, we spend almost twice as much per capita on health care as do the people of any other country, $13,000 for every man, woman, and child. And one of the reasons that we spend so much is the high cost of prescription drugs in our country. The outrageous cost of prescription drugs in America means that one out of four of our people go to the doctor, get a prescription, and they cannot afford to fill that prescription. How many die as a result of that? How many suffer unnecessarily? Nobody knows. But my guess is it is in the millions. And I have talked to many of them in Vermont and around the country. Meanwhile, our insurance premiums are much higher than they should be, and hospital costs are soaring because of the high cost of prescription drugs. Further, the cost of prescription drugs in this country is putting an enormous burden on taxpayers and seniors by raising the cost of Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare alone spends at least $135 billion a year on prescription drugs. So this is not only a personal issue, it is an issue of the federal budget. Meanwhile, as we pay by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs, 10 of the top pharmaceutical companies in America made over $110 billion in profits in 2022. They are doing phenomenally well while Americans cannot afford the cost of the medicine they need. And the CEOs in general receive exorbitant compensation packages. This morning, we're going to hear a lot from our CEO panelists about how high prices are not their fault and that the PBMs are forcing Americans to pay much higher prices than they should be paying. But let us be clear. In 2022, Johnson & Johnson made nearly $18 billion in profit, paid its CEO over $27 million in compensation, and spent over $17 billion on stock buybacks and dividends. That same year, Merck made $14.5 billion in profits, handed out over $7 billion in dividends in their, uh, to their stockholders, and paid its CEO over $52 million in compensation. And Bristol-Myers Squibbs made $8 billion in profits last year, while recently spending over $12 billion on stock buybacks and dividends, and giving its CEO over $41 million in compensation. Now, why did a majority of members of this committee invite these three pharmaceutical CEOs to testify today? And the answer is pretty simple. Mr. Berna, we will want you to explain to the American people why Bristol-Myers Squibb charges patients in our country $7,100 a year for Eliquist, when that same exact product can be purchased for just $900 
in Canada and $650 in France. Mr. Duardo, we're going to ask you why Johnson & Johnson charges Americans with arthritis $79,000 for Solero when that same exact product can be purchased for just $20,000 in Canada and just $12,000 in France. Mr. Davis, please tell us later why Merck, why Merck charges Americans with cancer $191,000 a year for Keytruda when that same product can be purchased for $112,000 in Canada and $91,000 in France. And let's be clear, Johnson & Johnson, Merck, and Bristol-Myers Squibb are not just charging higher prices in the United States compared to other countries. They are also charging Americans much higher prices today than they did in the past, even accounting for inflation. From 2004 to 2008, the median price of innovative new drugs sold by these three companies was just $14,000. Inflation accounted. From 2019 to 2023, where we are today, the median price of new drugs sold by these three companies was $238,000. In other words, Americans are forced to pay higher and higher prices for the drugs they need to survive. And let's be clear, the overwhelming beneficiary of these high drug prices is the pharmaceutical industry. How do we know that? Well, that is precisely what they tell their investors. According to their own shareholder reports, Bristol-Myers Squibb made $34 billion selling the blood thinner Eliquis in the United States compared to just $22 billion in the rest of the world combined. Make their money in the United States. In other words, the U.S. accounts for nearly two-thirds of all global sales of Eliquis. Not a single dollar of this revenue is going to PBMs. 100% of it is going to Bristol-Myers Squibb. Johnson & Johnson has reported to its shareholders that it made over $30 billion in revenue selling the arthritis drug Stellara in the United States since 2016, more than twice as much as the rest of the world combined. Nothing to do with PBMs. Merck has reported to its shareholders that it made $43.4 billion selling the cancer drug Keytruda in the United States compared to $30 billion in the rest of the world combined. Now, our CEO panelists from the drug companies will tell us this morning how much it costs to develop new drugs and how often the research that they undertake for new cures is not successful. And they are right. We appreciate that. But what they have not told us in their written testimony is that 14 major pharmaceutical companies, including Johnson & Johnson and Merck, spent $87 billion more on stock buybacks and dividends over a recent 10-year period than what they spent on research and development. More on stock buybacks and dividends than in research and development. In fact, Bristol-Myers Squibb spent $3.2 billion more on stock buybacks and dividends in 2022 than it spent on research and development. Johnson & Johnson spent $46 billion more on stock buybacks and dividends than it's spent on research and development since 2012. In other words, these companies are spending more to enrich their own stockholders and CEOs than they are in finding new cures and new treatments. Now, the average American who hears all of this is asking a very simple question. How does all of this happen? What's going on? How could your companies charge us in some cases 10 times more than they charge Canadians or people around the world for the same drug. How do they get away with this when so many of our people cannot afford the high price of the drugs that they need? How can it be, uniquely among industrialized countries, that these companies, not just these companies, but the pharmaceutical industry in general, can raise prices anytime they want, to any level they want. Want to raise double prices? Do it any way they want. How do they get away with all of that? And here, in my view, is the answer. The United States government does not regulate drug companies, 
with very few exceptions, the drug companies regulate the United States government. That is the sad state of affairs in a corrupt political system. Over the past 25 years, the pharmaceutical industry, not just these companies, the entire industry, spent over $8.5 billion on lobbying and more than $745 million on campaign contributions. And let me be fair, fair here. Don't want to misspeak. They are bipartisan. They give to Republicans. They give to Democrats. And I am especially impressed by the Pfizer drug company. Pfizer is not here this morning contributing a million dollars to the Republican Party in Kentucky to expand its headquarters, named after Republican leader Mitch McConnell. But again, it's not just Republicans, it's Democrats as well. Unbelievable. This is an astounding fact. Last year, drug companies had over 1,800 well-paid lobbyists here in D.C. to make sure that Congress did their bidding. There are 535 members of Congress and 1,800 well-paid lobbyists, over three for every member of Congress. So if you want to know why you're paying the highest prices in the world, America, that's why. Now, here is some good news in the midst of all that. We are beginning, beginning to take on the greed of the pharmaceutical industry. As a result of the Inflation Reduction Act passed several years ago, Medicare, for the first time ever, is beginning to do what every major country on earth does and what the Veterans Administration has been doing for over 30 years, and that is to negotiate the lower prices of drugs, including uh, Genuvia, Stellara, and Eliquis. Let me conclude uh, by saying this. Uh, I am proud of what this committee up to this point has accomplished. Last year, as you'll all remember, the CEO of Moderna committed during a health committee hearing that his company would make certain that no one in America would have to pay for their vaccine out of pocket. We appreciated that. In a separate health committee hearing last May, the CEO of Eli Lilly committed that his company would not raise prices on existing insulin products after having, in fact, lowered them. But let's be clear, much more needs to be done. I look forward to hearing from our CEO panelists this morning as to how they are going to go forward to substantially lower the cost of prescription drugs in this country. Senator Cassidy, uh, you're now recognized for the opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Sanders. Uh, let's, let's just be clear. Everybody on this panel cares about the high cost of prescription drugs and wants to work on real solutions to address this. But it's also clear that this hearing is not about finding legislative solutions. It's kind of following a formula. We publicly, attack, we publicly attack private, well, I don't, but others, publicly attack private citizens for being successful under capitalism. We grossly over, oversimplify a problem and blame corporations. We demand CEOs come before the committee for public verbal stoning. Uh, we reject the offer to send top executives with subject matter expertise and responsibility regarding the issues at hand and threaten a subpoena when CEOs are suspicious that they won't get a fair shake. Hold the hearing, get sound bites, then pick another set of CEOs for a show trial. But we don't pass meaningful legislation. If that sounds familiar, that's been the hearing with Starbucks founder Howard Schultz, Moderna CEO Stefan Bansell, and now this hearing with the same formula. I would have gladly joined the chair in exploring solutions to address the high cost of prescription drugs. I'm a doc. I worked in a public hospital for the uninsured for 25 years. I did my best to get care to those who otherwise would not have received. I am aware of this. I'm also aware of the perverse incentives, um, the kind of like, my gosh, it shouldn't be high, but it is high. Bad actors game the system, and we need solutions that benefit patients and improve access. But the majority was not interested in working with this side of the dais to hold a serious hearing to inform serious legislation. They didn't seek Republican input. The goal was to haul you guys in to cry capitalism and blame these corporations for the high cost of drug prices. Now, by the way, of course drug companies play a role. And hopefully we'll get answers today to legitimate questions about how, how drugs are priced. But the problem is far greater and more complex than individual companies, or even a set of companies within an ecosystem which is incredibly complex. Why do Americans pay more for certain drugs than patients in other countries? To understand, we need to have a serious effort to navigate the network of perverse incentives throughout the healthcare system. 
I lived in it for 25 years. I am very kind of aware of it. Taking a substantive look at insurance benefit design, price transparency, regulatory barriers, intellectual property barriers, the perverse effect government discount programs have upon prices charged to commercial patients, et cetera. One example, just to say again, a little bit of complexity here, the 340B drug program resulted in a $54 billion in drug discounts in 2022. But we actually don't know if those discounts lowered prices for the patient who bought the drug. There are reports that patients paid cash when the intermediary took the full price, even though 340B should have lowered it. That is a serious investigation being conducted by this side of the dais that the other side of the dais was not interested in participating in. That is an understanding of an ecosystem. I understand there's no one more eloquent than Chair Sanders on Medicare for All. And we can cherry pick examples of how other countries are doing something better. I can cherry pick the opposite. Canada is struggling, just, just to show you that there's a complexity here, let me just take an example. Canada is struggling with specialty care. In May of last year, the Canadian government began to send 4,800 Canadians from British Columbia to Washington State to, quote, ensure people have faster access to life-saving radiation treatment, end quote. They can afford their system because we're right next door. Relatedly to this hearing and to that, Alison Declizo, a Canadian woman, paid for her own treatment in the United States after the Provincial Health Authority in British Columbia denied her access to life-saving chemotherapy. Canada had a lower cost drug so low they didn't carry the chemotherapy. So she paid for it out of pocket in the United States so she could have life-saving chemotherapy. The United States is not perfect, but if we cherry pick from other countries, we have to do a more thorough investigation to see is there a balance there. Now let's return to prescriptions. Canadians pay more, less than we do. Let's figure out why. But let's also point out that public health insurance in Canada only covers 21% of newly developed drugs. Now, maybe that's a trade-off, but I can tell you, you tell an American that they can't have access to a life-saving court, a life-saving drug, they're gonna see you in court. Uh, they're gonna sue and they're gonna say, I want that access. The UK only covers 48% of newly available drugs. Americans just would not tolerate that. It's fair to say that Ms. Declouseau are those radiation treatment patients, are those not getting the newly developed life-saving drugs as quickly, might die in those countries that don't have access to the same treatments as do we in the US. These are serious questions. One more time, I'm a doc. Uh, I am aware of this but we need to fully consider all these issues and then maybe bring you in at the end. Uh, but we'll bring in with a context which is complete as opposed to isolated. As I said at the start, it would be best if this were a genuine exercise. I am so willing to do the work on this, as are my colleagues. We've shown that, uh, that willingness on work on PBM reforms and generic drugs. Um, and even though the chair and I got off to a rocky start, we did some pretty good work on that, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think we've got some good bipartisan le legislation. So this committee, I agree with you, can accomplish that. But I don't want the committee to devolve into a CEO whack-a-mole, ends up with no serious legislation as a result. Further proof of what I consider the unserious and cynical nature of this hearing is that the minority asked the chair to have a witness on the panel that could actually explore some of these issues side by side these CEOs. That was turned down. We wanted an academic expert in drug pricing who could provide unbiased and substantive input to the issues at hand. Our witness was not allowed. He'll be on the next, but the way this works is this gets all the publicity and the next one gets crickets. And so we've not had that opportunity. Um, and I'll also point out, we didn't split the majority and minority witnesses into different panels during several hearings which promoted kind of labor union issues. I can think of no reason to not allow our witness to be here now, uh, except perhaps ruining the optics. As I said at our last markup, what ends up being hollow messaging gives DC a bad reputation. Folks want real answers. They want relief from high prices. It is in part what we're gonna to hear today, but it will be separated from a context that would have made it a lot more productive. If you're telling voters you're gonna do something when you know at the get-go 
you have no legislative solution which emerges. And that's why folks don't trust. So um, if we're just looking for a social media clip, then I suppose we've accomplished something. But let's make a difference for the people whom we represent, for those patients in hospitals where I once treated who otherwise would not have access to care. We have the ability to craft meaningful legislation. Let's do it. With that, I yield. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Uh, our first witness will be Joaquin Duato, uh, Chairman and CEO uh, of Johnson & Johnson. Mr. Duato has served as Johnson & Johnson's Chairman since 2023 and Chief Executive Officer since 2022. Mr. Duato, thanks very much for being with us. Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Johnson & Johnson has collaborated with this committee over several decades to advance healthcare solutions for patients, including on diversity on clinical trials, nursing and healthcare workforce, pandemic preparation, mental health, and regulatory pathways for novel cell and gene therapies. I applaud this committee for your commitment to such critical priorities. I have been with J&J for more than 35 years and have held roles in Europe and in the US. I understand the global challenges and complexities of healthcare innovation and delivery. And today, I look forward to discussing our approach to pricing and the work we do to advance healthcare for all Americans. Fundamentally, our decision making is guided by the values set forth on our credo, which states that our first responsibility is to the patients. Our drug pricing decisions reflect our commitment to bringing forward innovative medicines for patients today and for patients tomorrow. First, our prices are based on the value our medicines bring to patients, the healthcare system, and society. We take into consideration that our medicines improve patients' quality of life and survival rates, while often reducing healthcare costs. And for context, in 2022, the average net price of our medicines declined for the sixth year in a row by 3.5 percentage points. Over those six years, prices have declined by almost 20% and the real inflation-adjusted price decline was more than 40%. Second, we price our medicines to support patient access. In 2022 alone, we paid $39 billion in rebate, discounts, and fees, almost 60% of the average list price of our drugs, with the intent that patients benefit from these substantial cost savings. We also support patient affordability and access by funding patient assistance programs. In 2022, these programs help more than 1, billion and 1 million underinsured patients. And we donated $3.8 billion in free medicines and other support to help patients with no insurance. Finally, we price our medicines to meet our commitment to innovate and develop differentiated and novel medicines for patients. The investment required to do so is massive. The average cost of bringing a drug through clinical trials in our industry is more than $2 billion. However, more than 90% of the drugs that enter clinical trials do not make it to patients. Consequently, our R&D investment is enormous and totally totals near $78 billion since 2016. Despite the tremendous investment required to bring drugs to patients, drug costs in the U.S have not increased significantly as a percentage of total overall healthcare costs. In fact, drug spending in the US is about 14% of healthcare spending, slightly below the average for the rest of the world. While total US healthcare spending is higher than other developed nations, this spending allows American patients to receive cutting edge healthcare earlier than any other country in the world. However, the burdensome copay obligations imposed in the U.S. are hard for patients to meet and undermine access and health equity. Remarkably, the GAO found that patient copay obligations often exceed payer costs for their drugs. This means that patients sometimes pay more for their medicines than their insurers. Clearly, this part of the system is not working as intended. We support proposals to reconcile this inequity and to ensure patient access. As outlined in my testimony, Congress should stop middlemen from taking for themselves the assistance that pharmaceutical companies intend for patients. And finally, it is essential that we reject 
the price caps and controls that exist in other countries which stand innovation. Our nation's robust biopharmaceutical industry was created by policy choices that prioritize earlier patient access to breakthrough medicines and incentivize investment in medical innovation. Thank you for the bipartisan efforts of this committee and for the opportunity to engage in today's discussion. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Duardo. Our next witness will be Robert Davis, Chairman and CEO of Merck. Mr. Davis has served as Merck's Chairman since December 2022 and CEO since 2021. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis, for being here. Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. As the CEO of Merck, I'm here to offer concrete policy suggestions to address the barriers American patients may encounter as they attempt to access our medicines and the current pricing system, while also ensuring Merck may discover and develop the next generation of life-saving medicines and vaccines. Based in Rawway, New Jersey, our company is one of the world's most advanced research-intensive biopharmaceutical companies, an organization at the forefront of providing innovative health solutions that advance the prevention and treatment of disease in people and animals. I've worked in the healthcare industry for the entirety of my 34-year career. I joined Merck 10 years ago in large measure because the company was on the precipice of its first approval for Keytruda, a revolutionary oncology treatment. At the time, people close to me were battling cancer, and unfortunately, they were not able to benefit from this amazing discovery. Following that first approval, Merck has demonstrated the efficacy of Keytruda in 39 indications and reached nearly 2 million patients with many of the most widespread cancers afflicting Americans. The impact of Keytruda and other recent advances is difficult to overstate. With a recent American Cancer Society report finding that cancer mortality in the United States has fallen 33 percent from 1991 to 2021, representing an estimated 4 million Americans whose deaths have been averted. And our work continues as we advance Keytruda into even more tumor types and earlier stages of cancer. Remarkable progress like this does not come cheaply. For Keytruda alone, between 2011 and 2023, Merck has invested $46 billion in development, and we expect to invest another $18 billion into the 2030s. And oncology is just one of Merck's many areas of discovery. Right now, we have nearly 20,000 researchers seeking breakthrough treatments for immune disorders, infectious diseases, Alzheimer's, and other ailments threatening the health of millions of people. To advance this critical work, We've invested more than $159 billion in R&D since 2010, including $30 billion in 2023 alone, and have invested more than $10 billion in capital in the form of both investments in manufacturing and R&D over the last five years in the United States, creating more jobs for Americans. We do not hesitate to make these investments because they are necessary to further Merck's mission to serve patients. At the same time, many Americans are struggling to afford health care, including prescription medicines, and we're eager to find solutions to these access and affordability challenges. That's why we supported changes to the Medicare Part D program to create an out-of-pocket cap that allow beneficiaries to pay their cost over time. We've also publicly disclosed our U.S. pricing data, including the average rebates and discounts we provide. In addition, we offer coupons and support, a patient assistance program for those who cannot, uh, who, who cannot afford the medications they need. In the past five years, this program has helped nearly 800,000 patients to obtain Merck products free of charge with an estimated value of $7.8 billion. But the reality is that Merck's efforts alone are far from sufficient. They do not and cannot address the underlying systemic and structural issues underpinning our system. As more power and control has been concentrated into the ever smaller number of vertically consolidated players, their negotiating strength has increased dramatically. In contracting with them, Merck continues to experience increasing pressure to provide even larger discounts, and the gap between list and net price continues to grow. And patients are not benefiting from the steep discounts we provide. These problems could be addressed if other actors' revenue streams were delinked from list prices thereby removing incentives for the system to favor high list prices. This would also ensure that less value in the system flows to these metalmen who do not create these medicines, who do not discover or develop or manufacture them. 
In addition, the substantial savings provided by Merck and other manufacturers should be required to be passed through to patients to lower their out-of-pocket costs. We firmly believe that reforms like these will create a drug pricing system that incentivizes the discovery of new and important medicines, while at the same time ensuring patients can afford those life-saving medicines and innovations. Future treatment breakthroughs hinge on what we do now. We must hold on to a U.S. pharmaceutical market that is free, competitive, and predictable, one that encourages and rewards investment, one that drives the American economy and creates jobs, and one that continues to deliver innovation and new treatment discoveries. I'm here today to pledge our support and cooperation in these efforts. Thank you for your time and your consideration of these important perspectives. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. Our third witness will be Chris Berna, CEO of Bristol Myers Squibb. Dr. Berna has served as CEO of Bristol Myers Squibb since November 2023. Thanks for being here, Mr. Berna. Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and members of the committee, <clears throat> thank you for having me here today. I'm proud to be representing Bristol Myers Squibb, an American company that is committed to transforming patients' lives through science. I've spent more than 20 years in this industry, the majority in smaller, science-driven biotechnology companies. I joined BMS because we have a similar focus on driving leading-edge scientific innovation, and our scale allows us to bring more medicines to more patients faster. To help illustrate the type of work that we've been doing for more than 150 years at BMS, let me provide two illustrations of how our innovative medicines have helped patients and provided tangible benefits to society. Our work in HIV AIDS transformed this disease from a death sentence into a chronic condition. Similarly, our pioneering immuno-oncology treatments, Obdivo and Eurovoy, harness the body's immune system to fight cancer and can have contributed significantly to improved outcomes across a number of tumors including metastatic melanoma, where the combination of these two medicines has changed the median life expectancy from less than nine months to over six years. I'm proud that our record of innovation continues today. We've invested more than $65 billion in research and development over the past decade. This has resulted in truly novel and transformational medicines like Chemzios in cardiovascular disease, our cell therapy platform in cancer, and we are working toward bringing to patients the first medicine for the treatment of schizophrenia in 30 years. These medicines are but a few examples of the innovation that results from an American healthcare system that not only accounts for the majority of new medicines launched each year, but also one that delivers those medicines to US patients faster than anywhere else in the world. This isn't by chance. The United States has built a healthcare system that prioritizes patient and physician choice, as well as the broad and rapid availability of cutting edge medicines. This is in stark contrast to many systems outside of the United States, which while they may deliver lower prices, carry an often overlooked trade-off. That patients often wait longer for new medicines that are sometimes never approved or reimbursed. For example, Canadian patients have access to approximately half of the medicines available in the United States, and patients in other countries face a similar reality. Despite its benefits, we know our American system is far from perfect. Patients bear the brunt of a complex U.S. system that results in increasing health care costs and a lack of affordability. We have to make the system work better for them. After all, innovation that does not make it to patients is no innovation at all. While prescription medicines account for a relatively small portion of overall healthcare spending, we believe we have an important role to play in prioritizing the development of medicines that will bring savings to the healthcare system. And as an industry, we should set a higher bar for doing just that. Similarly, we have a role to play in addressing affordability and stand ready to partner with Congress and others to address this issue for patients in a holistic manner. But in developing those solutions, we should not abandon our system for one that denies U.S. patients 
the broad and rapid access to vital medicines that they appreciate today. We support policies that lower patient out-of-pocket costs without ultimately harming innovation. The need to strike this balance should not be abstract. I expect many of us in this room have lost a loved one to cancer or another devastating disease. In my case, it was one of my best friends, and it happened as he awaited a medicine that I believe could have saved his life. This is an almost daily reminder to me that making patients wait for weeks, months, or years can be the difference between life and death. Thank you again for having me here today on behalf of BMS and the more than 30,000 employees who share my passion for delivering new medicines for patients. I look forward to answering your questions. Mr. Berner, thank you uh, very much. Uh, before I uh, begin the first round of, of questions, uh, let me remind our witnesses uh, that while the Health Committee does not swear in uh, witnesses as a general rule, federal law at 18 U.S. Code Section uh, 1001 prohibits knowingly and willingly making any fraudulent statement to the Senate, regardless of whether a person is under oath. Uh, I would also say, uh, in response to m many of your testimonies, we are aware of the many important life-saving drugs that your companies have produced, and that's extraordinarily important. But I think, as all of you know, those drugs mean nothing to anybody who cannot afford it. And that's what we're dealing with today, that millions and millions of our people cannot afford the outrageously high cost of prescription drugs in this country. Now, uh, my time and the time of all of the members is limited. So we're going to just, uh, I'm going to ask. Wait, are we starting the clock? So my time is limited. So I'm going to start by asking all of you uh, a number of questions, and I would appreciate it if you could respond uh, with a yes or no answer. Uh, it turns out that in our dysfunctional and extraordinarily expensive healthcare system, uh, hundreds of thousands of Americans have gone to GoFundMe in order to raise money to pay for their health care needs uh, and for their prescription drugs. Um, let me ask Mr. Davis, if I might, uh, have you ever searched on GoFundMe for your cancer drug, uh, Kichula? Uh, no, I have not. Okay. Uh, we have. I and my staff have. And we have found uh, over 500 stories of people trying to raise funds to pay for their cancer treatments. Uh, and one of those stories is a woman named Rebecca, a school lunch lady from Nebraska, with two kids who died of cancer after setting up a GoFundMe page because she could not afford to pay for Katruda. Rebecca had raised $4,000 on her GoFundMe page, uh, but said the cost of Katruda and her cancer treatment was $25,000 for an infusion every three uh, weeks. Uh, Mr. Davis, and, and please, yes or no, is it true that the list price of Katruda is $191,000 a year in the United States? Uh, that is close to being true, yes. Thank you. Is it true that that same exact drug can be purchased in Canada for $112,000 a year and $44,000 a year in Japan? Generally, yes. Uh, Mr. Davis, even though the price of Katruda is one quarter of the price in Japan compared to the United States, does uh, your company, does Merck make a profit selling Katruda in Japan? We do. So what I understand is you make a profit selling Katruda in Japan for one quarter of the price that you sell it for in the United States. My question to you is a pretty simple one. Will you commit to lowering the price of Katruda in the United States to the price of Japan? Well, Senator, I, I think um, first I acknowledge the prices in the United States are higher uh, than they are in many of the countries you said, and, and not for all drugs, but for many drugs, and that, that's the reality we face. But I think it's also important to point out that you get access in the United States faster and more than anywhere in the world. We have 39 indications for Keytruda across 17 tumor types in the United States. If you look across Europe, 
it's in the 20s. If you look across Japan, it's in that number or a little bit less. So there is a reason why the prices are different, and we need to be careful because we are also seeing in those markets that they are unwilling to support the innovation, and, and we are very hardly well, working hard to try to get them to understand the need to help it fund the innovation. I, I apologize for cutting that's, off. That's fine. There are two other ways, but I did want to make this point. Uh, again, we all appreciate the breakthrough in important drugs that you and other companies have produced that save lives. No debate about that. But I do want to point out that after all is said and done, and after all of the money we spend on prescription drugs and healthcare in general, the life expectancy in Japan is nine years longer than it is in the United States. Uh, Senator Cassidy talked about Canada. The life expectancy in Canada is six years longer than in the United States. Life expectancy in Portugal is six years longer. Life expectancy in the UK is four years longer. Um, let me ask the last question to Mr. Davis. As I understand it, you made $52 million in total compensation in 2022. Will you commit to not accepting a single dollar more in compensation until there is not a single GoFundMe page for Katruda. Well, I can tell you at Merck, we are very much sensitive to what's happening with patients. That's why we have very important patient assistance programs. We commented on the fact that we have over 800,000 patients benefiting where we provide free drug for those who can't afford it, as well as other assistance programs that help with copay and others. So we are very committed as a company to doing what we need to do to try to help alleviate the, ch the challenges patients face that you're focusing on. And that's my focus as the CEO. Okay, thank you. Mr. Berna, uh, with Bristol Myers Squibb. Uh, Carolyn from Florida says that she cannot afford Eliquis, and so she will, quote, stop taking it, though I need it to prevent the risk of having a stroke, end quote. Uh, Mr. Berna, uh, again, yes and no, please. The list price of Eliquis is $7,100 a year in the United States. Dr. Melissa Barber, an expert at Yale University, has estimated that it costs just $18 to manufacture a year's supply of Eliquis. $7,100, what we pay $1,800 to manufacture. Is it true that the same exact drug, Eliquis, can be purchased in Canada for $900 a year? Senator, that's roughly correct. Uh, let me ask you this. Even at 13%, of the cost in the United States, does Bristol Myers make a profit selling Eliquis for $900 a year in Canada? Uh, Senator, we do make a profit. All right, so you're selling the product for 13% of what in Canada, of what we pay in the United States, and obviously you sell it there because you make money. So, Mr. Berner, will you commit today? that Bristol Miles Squibb will reduce the list price of Eliquis in the United States to the price that you charge in Canada where you make a profit? Senator, we can't make that commitment primarily because the prices in these two countries have very different systems that prioritize very different things. In Canada, medicines are generally made less available, and it takes oftentimes considerably longer for those medicines to be available on I, average. I, I, roughly I apologize. I do apologize. I just, life expectancy in Canada is six years longer than it is in the United States. Uh, Mr. Berner, your company spent over $12 billion on stock buybacks in 2022. Given that reality, can you tell Carolyn why you can't lower the price of Eliquis? First, Senator, let me say no patient should have to go through the types of choices that the patient you just described go through. It is our commitment to continue to bring down the price of medicines in the U.S., and I would love the opportunity to bring down the price of Eliquis in the U.S. Our net prices, what we are compensated, have actually over the last five years declined. At that same time, the list prices have increased. Why is that? Because of the complexity of this system and the billions of dollars in rebates that we have provided to intermediaries that unfortunately do not go to lowering the price of medicines like the patient you just described. Again, I apologize. I want to get very briefly uh, to with Mr. Duardo, who's with Johnson & Johnson. Uh, 
Mr. Duetto, is it true that the list price of Stellara is $79,000 a year in the U.S.? Is that roughly it, right? It's roughly right, but it's also true that the average discount of Stellara in the and U.S. I, I, is I, 70%. I, so now it's all that, of that, and we've dealt with PBMs, and we're going to get to that, I'm sure, in this, this morning. Is it true that while charging 79000 in the United States, that the exact same product is sold in Spain for $18,000? I don't know the price in Spain. Uh, I can tell you that the average discount in the U.S. is 70%, so the price that you quote is 30% of that. Okay. Mr. Duero, is it true that it costs less than $15 a year to man manufacture Stellaro? The manufacturing cost is only a component that goes into our pricing. When we price our medicines, we're looking at the value that the medicine brings to the healthcare system, our ability to continue to invest in research. We invested $15 billion last year. And also, we look at affordability. Uh, the average copay, if they use our copay assistance programs in the U.S. for a patient using Estelara, is 10 to $15 dollars Per month. I apologize. I'm over my time. I'm going to give Senator Cassidy the same time that uh, I had. Thank you all. Uh, Mr. Duato, uh, the, um, in 2021, J Janssen constructed an exclusionary contract with their PBMs to protect Remicade, their blockbuster drug, a treatment for ulcerative colitis, very familiar with it, a wonderful drug, changed the outcome for people with UC. But this deal protected uh, Remicade from competition by a new biosimilar, Inflectra, which was launched at a 16% lower cost than Remicade. Now, I understand this is confidential in terms of the settlement with the courts. But, and by the way, let me just say, this, this involves a rebate wall. So for the sake of those who are watching, a rebate wall is an anti-competitive tool which can be used to restrict a competitor's entry into a formulary. A manufacturer would offer more significant rebates to a health plan through a PBM for access to the formulary contingent upon the PBM blocking a biosimilar. Now, we have been discussing the promise of biosimilars to lower the cost in a market-oriented, competitive way. So if we're not going to have government regulation, we've got to have a market uh, situation, and the market would be a biosimilar, but this sort of arrangement blocked the biosimilar from entering. So, um, uh, so in, in the full support of a market-oriented uh, approach, do any of your current contracts employ rebate walls to prevent lower-cost biosimilars from for formulary access? We welcome biosimilars and genetics. We believe it's an integral part of the system. As a matter of fact, in the U.S., 90% of the prescriptions are biosimilars and genetics, and that's one of the reasons pharmaceutical expenses have remained flat or increase single digit during the last uh, years. Uh, we believe that biosimilars and genetic foster patient access, and we care deeply about that. And we don't... But, but, but let me ask, because my specific question, do any of your current contracts employ rebate walls? Our current contracts do not employ any technique to avoid biosimilars and genetics to have uptake in the market. Okay, thank you. Now, I think at least two of you, maybe all three of you, are working on gene therapy. I've been concerned that we don't really know how we're going to price those. And I think one of the concerns is that there will not be a market force to lower the cost of an initial gene therapy, which are incredible. It's amazing the lifetime of benefit that gene therapy can, can um, create. But I was speaking to a medical director of uh, Medicaid CMO, uh, and he was telling me that the pharmaceutical cost uh, related to Medicaid, it's now 35%, where formerly it was like 25 or or 30%. And he says it's being driven by gene therapy. And when sickle cell comes widely spread, it's, it's going to, I don't know how it's going to be priced, but my state has a lot of sicklers. I don't know how my state's going to be able to afford uh, giving it to everybody who should have access. So very concisely, how are we going to show restraint on the price of some of these new gene therapies which already is driving up Medicaid. So again, 35% of Medicaid is now pharmaceutical cost. Uh, Mr. Berner, I'll start with you. Senator, we actually don't work in gene therapy. Oh, then let me go to Davis. 
Mr. Davis? We actually do not work in G30. Oh, I thought I saw you had a press release that y'all were doing so. You had a vector or something. No, we're, okay. uh, well, we're doing some very basic research, but we have nothing in advanced stages. Mr. Otto? We do have a gene therapy served for treating inherited retinal diseases, and we support legislation in order to be able to do value-based contracts in the case of gene therapy. So we welcome legislation in order to be able to have value-based contracts. And that's, a real, that's, that's good. Value-based contracting will be important, but it still doesn't address the opening cost. Uh, because if the opening cost is sky high, you, still, you see where I'm going with that. Now, what would you give to us who believe in markets uh, a solution to an opening price that would be so much, it would be difficult for society to afford uh, the gene therapy? And, I, and I, could feel, I could put in any other drug. But let's just start with gene therapy. We, we have to look at the value of these uh, therapies and the fact that gene therapy for inherited retinal diseases may affect only uh, less than 1,000 people in the world. So we have to understand that. And you can rest assured that if we are fortunate enough to bring this solution that people that have diseases that can lead to blindness will sit down and evaluate very thoroughly our pricing in order to make sure that patients, all patients that need this therapy, are able to afford it. I think I recall a couple of years ago there was a study that was shown, respected, uh, you probably know it better than I, that $2 million for gene therapy for ultra-rare diseases was a reasonable, a reasonable sort of, it would cover the cost, it would create the incentive to produce more. And that would be for the ultra-rare, where presumably you wouldn't have the ability to produce more. You know, obviously the more you produce, you get a little bit extra profit. You, you know where I'm going with that. So, um, um, but that shows restraint, if you will, on the, on the behalf of the manufacturer. Um, now, we want to create incentive, but we want to be able to provide access. And without access, it's as if the drug has never been invented. So, is there any other thoughts you have on how society, um, if, if that's ultra-rare, $2 million, presumably if it's not ultra-rare, it would be less. How can we have a market-oriented approach to this? Because I truly am concerned about the ability of a Medicaid program to be able to afford some of these gene therapies. We care deeply about uh, our medicines getting to the patients that need it, especially in these, as you have mentioned, ultra-rare diseases that have uh, therapy can have life-changing consequences. So we will always uh, sit down and make sure that the way we price is reflective of the value of the medicine, but also importantly, it enables affordability and it makes it possible that every patient that's needed in America now, can get Now, the affordability, it. though, we're defining affordability for the patient. So if Medicaid covers it, it's by definition affordable for the patient or if insurance does. But then that doesn't necessarily make it affordable for society. Uh, and society has got to pay for it, and obviously Medicaid is taking more and more of a state's budget, and frankly, more and more of the federal budget. I'm not sure there's an answer there, but, but let me just challenge you, because we want market-oriented solutions, uh, um, uh, and we want to create incentives so that good companies like the three of you and others are making these new things. But if my state goes bankrupt paying for a new gene therapy, then my state's, the taxpayer, we all are tough, you know, in tough shape. Now, let me just go to one more thing. Um, there's evidence that pharmaceutical companies will do life cycle management kind of to prolong the sort of exclusivity of a drug. Um, and, and some have argued that that actually defeats innovation because as opposed to making profit from innovation, you can make profit from life cycle management. Uh, any thoughts about that, Mr. Berner? Senator, I think life cycle management, if you think about the extension of new indications for a product, is incredibly important to really being able to deliver additional benefits to patients. Obviously, the patents associated with any product will dictate when a generic enters. We have been in favor of a robust generic entry primarily because our focus is on innovative products. But think, for example, in cancer, where typically you start the treatment of cancer very late in disease, learn more about how the drug works, show it safe, but ultimately you can bring that into early stage cancer where you have the potential to potentially cure patients. Now that takes quite a bit of time, but that's an example of a life cycle management where you are actually showing the true potential of a medicine. I would hate for us to cut off the opportunity to show those benefits. At the same time, we should be as an industry welcoming of generic competition because ultimately our focus as a company 
is to take resources as we get close to generic entry and focus those resources on the next wave of new product innovation, which is where I think we ultimately want to go for patients. Mr. Davis, you got 20 seconds, man. How would you do that? Well, the short answer is, uh, as I look at it, one, we very much support uh, generic drugs and biosimilar drugs. I think it's the core of how our system works. We have a, a period where we're protected. We are able to recoup our investment, and then society benefits in perpetuity beyond that. Um, as we look at life cycle management, we always are asking, are we bringing value to the patient? I'll give you a live example. If you look at Keytruda, Keytruda now, as I mentioned, is in 39 indications across 17 tumor types. It is revolutionizing the care of patients facing cancer. The reality of it is still only 30% of people show overall response. So as great as it is, patients are still suffering. And what we are doing is investing in combination therapies to be able to extend and go beyond that 30%, which means much better benefit and value to the patients that will ultimately use those drugs. Thank you. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this really important uh, hearing. Um, uh, Mr. Duato, um, looking at your arthritis drug, and we've talked already a little in this hearing about the difference in price between the United States and other countries, annual cost around $80,000 in the United States, $20,000 in Canada, $12,000 in France. Are the prices that you receive from a country like Canada or France, which look to me to be about one quarter of the price that you get from the United States, are those prices covering your costs? Yes, they do. To clarify, Senator, the price in the U.S. is discounted by 70 percent. So the appropriate comparison would be 25000 in the case of Estelara if you are considering that price. Are the prices you're receiving from these other countries, so let's, let's say France, let, I'll give you the benefit of your argument, France is still 20, it's still 50 percent of the U.S. cost that you're claiming. Are those countries' prices covering your costs? They do. The difference is that, for example, in Canada, which was the first country you quoted, uh, Stellara, which is mainly indicated for inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, not for arthritis, is not yet reimbursed in the public system. So Canadian patients that want to access Estelara, they cannot do it in the, in the public system because eight years, eight years later, is not yet reimbursed there. So you don't identify any free rider syndrome today in which the United States is paying higher prices, allowing other nations to receive lower prices? I agree with you that the prices in the U.S. Uh, are generally higher for medicines, more aligned than what you are describing, as the rest of the, of the healthcare system prices are. The percentage of pharmaceutical expenses over total healthcare expenses in the U.S. is 14 percent, and that is lower than most of the advanced economies. The real difference is that in the U.S., patients get access to therapy, life-saving therapy, years before they do in the countries that you mentioned. If the United States were to restrict the prices we paid, would that create a different negotiating dynamic in countries that right now, for instance, are paying 50 percent of what the United States pays? Would it allow you in your negotiations to get higher prices from other nations that right now are paying far less than the United States? We believe that price caps uh, are not the way that innovation is going to be fostered. Uh, we have worked with the United States Trade Department and with U.S. embassies around the world to try to reject the price caps that some countries, as the one you mentioned, impose. And we welcome the support of the U.S. government in avoiding that these governments are ultimately imposing price caps on us that are not benefiting their patients neither. What do you say to Americans who look at the way that you allocate revenue and wonder why, in your case, for instance, you are spending $6 billion on stock buybacks, $11 billion on dividends, and $14 billion on research and development. You spend all of your advertising time talking about the research and development spend, but I think most Americans would be pretty surprised, given how much the industry talks about research and development, that you are actually spending more money shelling out 
money to investors and buying back stock than you are on research and development. What do you say to folks who look at that and come to the conclusion that you care much more about keeping your investors happy and keeping your uh, executives happy than you do in researching and development the next class of drugs that's going to help we care, we care deeply about patients, Senator, and we care deeply about being able to discover the next medicines that are going to address major problems like Alzheimer. Our well, I'm not, but, 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 but explain to me how you justify that division of dividends and stock buybacks versus research development. You could just choose, instead of using $6 billion to buy back stock, to put that into more research and development, but you don't. Our level of R&D investment in the two years that refer to the six billion program buyback, which were 2022 and 2023, is six times higher. So in that period, we invested 30 billion dollars in R&D and six billion dollars in stock in stock buyback. So we spend six times more in developing cures for patients that we did in stock buyback. Well, I'm looking at 2022 profits and spending by Johnson and Johnson, and it shows me 11 billion dollars in dividends, six billion dollars in stock buybacks, 45 million dollars in executive compensation and 14 billion dollars in research and development can you understand let me ask you a different question can you understand that you know one of my constituents in connecticut would look at those numbers and think that you care more about patting the pockets of the folks that um, work for you and invest in you than in research and development our priority is investing in R&D. We have spent uh, $77 billion since 2016. And yes, we have to pay dividends because it's the only way that the company can remain operational and sustainable. Otherwise, if we are not operational and sustainable, we are not able to fulfill our mission of developing medicine for patients and make them, them affordable. Mr. Bohr, you talked in your testimony about the United States has a healthcare system that prioritizes the important role of patient choice. I just want to present you with the case of one of my constituents and ask you about the choices that she faces. So I have a constituent who needs Eliquis. This is a blood thinner that is critical to her survival. She has priced a Medicare plan that gets her the best possible price. And that price is $350 a month. The average Social Security benefit in Connecticut is about $1,700 a month. And of course, somebody who's on Eliquis is likely on other drugs as well. So here's her choice. Her choice is to pay the $350 and go without food or pay her rent late or not take the drug and risk heart attack or stroke. Is that the choice you're talking about when you refer to a healthcare system that prioritizes the important role of choice? Senator, absolutely not. And in fact, I would say on behalf of all of our employees at Bristol Myers Squibb, that is a choice no patient should have to make. But, but, she, but she makes it. She makes it because you have chosen to price a drug at a point that is unaffordable. Senator, we have priced Eliquis in the U.S. In our, in our estimation, in fact, we try to do this for all of our medicines, consistent with the value it brings. And we're very happy with the fact that Eliquis is the leading anti-stroke drug. Why, why not take, why not, you, you, you put $8 billion into stock buybacks. Why not? do four billion and instead take the rest of the money and bring the price of the drug down? Um, I'm gonna keep people to seven. Uh, Senator Tuberville. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, it's pretty well known where our chairman, chairman stands on this. Uh, his worldwide view, uh, it's pretty clear that uh, he believes you guys are setting drug prices and it's all about corporate greed. I'm a true believer of capitalism. I believe that we have the best health care system in the world. The problem is we've gotten the federal government involved in it, and it's not implemented the way probably it should be. That being said, uh, I just got a few questions here on a couple of things. Mr. Davis, 
Can you explain me something? Uh, the Biden administration has two huge priorities. Dictate prices of prescription drugs, specific, specifically small molecule drugs, and cure cancer. Can you walk me through how those priorities might be in direct contradiction of each other? Well, Senator, uh, and I think what you're referring to is uh, what is called the pill penalty That's correct. Uh, underneath the IRA, and what that does is effectively uh, at, says that at nine years post your first approval, uh, your price or your drug will be negotiated, and if it's a small molecule, it's 13 if it's a large. The issue um, that that raises is that it disfavors small molecule development, and the reality of it is if you look across the majority of cancer treatments, they are still small molecules. And uh, as, as Chris pointed out earlier, the development of cancer drugs usually starts in a phase starting at the, at the very most sickest patient, the, the, the last stage of disease, and then you work forward into earlier stages of disease where, in fact, you can start to maybe talk about cure. To the, do those studies in early stage disease, often called adjuvant or neoadjuvant care, and we have nine approvals in that space, those studies can take seven to nine years to do. So obviously, if at nine years I have to significantly reduce the price of that drug to a point that it is potentially, you know, at basically no profit. My incentive to do those follow-on studies is, is not there. And, and that is our worry that if you look at cancer care, you're going to see patients suffer because we can't get to really talking about cure, which is an earlier stage of disease. I'd also point out, you didn't ask about um, Alzheimer's and neuroscience diseases, but most CNS diseases also require small molecules because large, large molecules, biologics, can't penetrate the blood-brain barrier. So we are um, disincentivizing some of the largest areas of sickness and chronic need in our society through that pill penalty you referred to. Thank you, Mr. Boehner. Uh, we hear a lot about how health care costs are ridiculous high. I think all of us would agree to that to some degree. Uh, I want to peel back the onion here a little bit. Uh, today we're being led to believe that these costs are due to corporate greed. I want to know if we're going to talk about some additional drivers of health care costs. When the federal government dumped trillions into various industries during COVID, uh, we upended our markets and drove prices through the roof. You know, when I talk to healthcare folks back in Alabama, uh, labor cost is one huge problem. But there are other costs, including supplies and raw materials. You know, what impact are these having on the drug development and high drug costs? Certainly, Senator, when we look at the cost basis for us doing what we do as a company, which is to bring forward new medicines for patients, we have to factor in all of those costs. I'll give you an example in cellular therapy, which is really transforming very late line hematologic diseases. These are very complex medicines. You're taking patient cells, manufacturing them and re-engineering them to really target and hone in on cancer cells, and then you re-inject them in the patients. This is really a first generation technology. Unfortunately, it has very high labor cost because this is one that's very manual. It's a multi-step process to manufacture these products. Their transportation costs, their raw material costs, all of those factors go in to a cost of these first generation medicines. Now we're very focused on trying to innovate to get to a second and third generation quickly so we can bring those costs down, not only because it's important for us to be able to funnel additional research into development, but also so that we can bring ultimately the cost down to patients so they are absolutely a factor, Senator. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Otto, uh, I'm going to ask you this with your accent and mine. We'll probably have a tough time. <laughs> but uh, I know you're probably aware in 2021, you weren't the CEO, I don't think, at that time, but the Biden administration announced a mandate that U.S. troops and personnel must take the COVID vaccine in order to serve in the military. Are you familiar with that? I'm familiar, sir. Yes. Thank you. Are you aware that more than 8,400 troops were kicked out of the military for, de for declining to take the COVID vaccine? These were mostly young, healthy Americans for whom COVID risk was low. Are you aware of that? No, I was not aware of that, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, did you or did anyone at Johnson & Johnson encourage the Biden administration to mandate 
this COVID vaccine to the military? Are you familiar with that? We did not, sir. Okay. How much did Johnson & Johnson benefit financially from the administration's military COVID vaccine mandate? Could you have any kind of guess to that? Our effort in the COVID vaccine that we collaborated with the government, it was a time of a global emergency. So we thought that as a healthcare company that cares for patients, we needed to collaborate with the US government. That was entirely non-for-profit. Do you think the soldiers who were expelled from the military was the right thing to do? And should they be reinstated? I, I was not aware of this situation, sir. Uh, I am not aware of these circumstances, so I cannot comment on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator, Senator Murray. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. I think you know we hear from our constituents constantly um, and frighteningly about the cost of some of the drugs that they take. So this is really an important hearing, and I, I continue to hear, as many have said, um, that sky-high drug costs are forcing many people, including in my home state of Washington, cho to choose between filling their prescription and paying for other things they need, essentials like groceries or rent. And I often talk to people who are skipping their prescription altogether because they can't afford it, and it puts their life at risk. So I really believe that Congress does need to do more here. I have for a long time, and I also think pharmaceutical companies need to do much more to put patients first. And that doesn't mean that private companies can't make a profit, and I think we all have a really sincere appreciation for the cutting-edge research that happens at each of your companies. But when you say you're in the business of saving lives and cur curing disease, you have to think about putting patients over profits because, as we all know, life-saving drugs don't do anyone any good if people can't afford them. So I want to ask you about uh, affordability, and, and I've heard the numbers. I was listening in my office. Mr. Duato, um, a, your drug company makes uh, a product to treat arthritis, Stellara. It costs 79000 annually here in the U.S., 12000 in France. Mr. Davis, your company makes a drug to treat cancer, Keytruda. You've been talking about it. Annually, the cost here is 191000 44000 in Japan. And Mr. Berner, your company makes a drug, Eliquis, to treat the risk of stroke that costs $7,100 in the year and $770 in Germany. So, I mean, either you think that the same prescription drugs so, sold around the world work better here in America or uh, we're getting something more for it. I, you know, I don't think that's the case, but I wanted to ask each one of you um, explain to us why it costs more in terms that we can tell our constituents and they understand. Uh, and uh, Mr. Duato, let me talk to you. We share your concerns about uh, what patients have to pay at the pharmacy counter for medicines. In the case of Estelara that you mentioned, uh, the net price in the U.S. is 70 percent lower than the price that you refer, so it would be $24,000. It's still higher than in France, but it's more aligned than here. The difference is that patients with uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, which is the main indication with Estelara, were able to afford Estelara years earlier than they did in other countries. As a matter of fact, in Canada, after eight years that Estelara was approved, Estelara is not reimbursed in inflammatory bowel disease, nor in Crohn's disease, or ulcerative colitis. Ooh. What are we doing for that? We, are, we have strong patient assistance programs. A patient that has commercial insurance pays 10 to $15 a month for Estelara. And if they are not insured or underinsured, we have free medicine program. We distributed $3.9 billion in free drug in 2022. Mr. Davis. So if you look at, uh, at Keytruda and the example you're bringing up between uh, the U.S. and Japan, first of all, uh, like all of us, we are trying to focus on making sure that patients everywhere in the world get access to our medicines. Each market operates differently. Um, Japan is, is a unique market in that the way they price their drugs, um, and we uh, have been working hard to get this to change, and I think maybe we have successfully gotten some of it to change, is that after you initially launch your drug, for every indication that comes afterwards, they treat it as a different drug. And in addition, if a competitor launches a drug, 
then you also still take a price decrease because of the competitor drug. And we're in a strange situation, and one that's a very concerning situation to me in Japan, where in, in reality, we as the most innovative, we have the most indications, we were, we were driving the market fastest, we have by far the lowest discounted price in Japan, and the levels in Japan would not be sustainable to support the $46 you know, billion, $48 billion we spent on Katruda. So we are working hard to help those markets, and we could use government help there to understand that we need to, across the globe, share in making sure we can invest to support innovation. What, what would Congress do that would make a difference to lower prices here? I think, well, on, on one hand, it's a different question on lowering prices here. I think that's a question I'm assuming we're going to get to, but this is how do we focus on what is the really large discrepancy between the list price and the net price, which I believe we, we need to focus on is the out-of-pocket cost to the patient. That is really the core. Um, we need to address that, but in addition, we need to continue to work together on, we can work on trying to drive innovation clauses into trade agreements. We've had some success with that to, to also help us in those markets outside the United States as well. Mr. Breyer. Senator, there's no doubt that patients are going to pay less for our drug Eliquis or frankly most of our drugs outside of the U.S. than in the U.S. That unfortunately comes at a fairly significant cost for those patients outside of the U.S. In Canada, patients will wait roughly three and a half to four years to get access to a medicine that is available in the U.S. You see similar sort of stats in virtually every European country and in Japan. What we can do more in the U.S. to do is try to bring out-of-pockets down, out-of-pocket costs down. For Eliquis, for example, the average out-of-pocket is roughly $50, $55 in the U.S. Most patients will pay less than $40. However, there are still patients for whom this drug is absolutely not affordable. That's not acceptable. Medicare in particular is a space where we can't provide those types of copay support programs that we do in the commercial setting, so we would love to work with Congress on that. But probably the most important thing, and Eloquist is a great example of this, that we can do is try to bring down the list cost of Eloquist. So do you set the list price? So we set the list price, but that list price for Eloquist is driven up by the incentives of intermediaries. And let me give you an example of order of magnitude. Over the last five years, we have as a company paid almost $100 billion dollars in rebates and discounts to intermediaries, the majority of those were on Eliquis. And our ability, that's unfortunately what patients pay is a copay on that list price. We would love to work with Congress to bring that down. Senator Marshall. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Berner, I'll start with you. Bristol Myers um, makes this new miracle drug, Eliquis, relatively a miracle drug. You know, when I was in residency treating patients, I was using Coumadin, heparin, and then Coumadin. It might take three or four days to get someone heparinized, and then we switch them over to Coumadin. They might be in the hospital for 10 or 14 days. So in its own right, Eliquis, you know, saves money. It saves that length in the hospital and prevents hospitalizations as well. So I want to point that out. And as we think, talk about rationing care, we've discussed how we're rationing care in foreign countries. But I want you to speak about rationing care in this country. How do PBMs ration care when they take a drug like Eliquis and don't allow it on their formulary? Does that ever happen? Senator, I'm glad you raised that point. Um, we have had absolutely that case happen on multiple drugs. We've had it happen on Eliquis. We've had it happen where when we have not been able to reach an agreement with an intermediary, on a rebate that they've taken Eliquis off a of formulary. And when that happens, those patients no longer have access to Eliquis, and they have to go on to another branded, or in, in many cases, they may go on to warfarin, as you say. Yeah. Uh, Eliquis is the number one product in the oral anticoagulant space. Okay. And so I'm going to, sorry, so, catch. A, so, so they have to go back to warfarin, the Coumadin, the drug that I was using in medical school in the, in the 1980s, uh, a, a drug with significant complications, uh, a, a hassle factor, the patient has to go get blood testing done, you know, maybe twice a week as, as well. But with your drug, you know, the miracle, one of the miracle parts of it is, uh, A, they don't bleed into their brains anymore, and, and two, they don't have to go get their blood testing done once a week as, as well. So, you know, it's a huge amount of innovation and it's just, it amazes me how much power these PBMs have obtained. Let's go to Mr. Davis next. I want to talk about delinking 
and you have a at the time a pretty a miracle drug of your own to treat diabetes with and there's a list price how much of that what percentage of that list price does typically uh, Merck get at the end of the day so senator if you look at uh, Genuvia which is the drug you were speaking to uh, the list price is, is six thousand nine hundred dollars per year for per, year. per year uh, for for Merck we recognize six hundred and ninety dollars on that drug per year so of the list price you're only getting ten percent it's a ninety percent discount ninety percent discount where does the rest of that money go uh, into the into the middlemen into the system as a whole if 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 we had the time and the energy and a chalkboard would you be able to ex explain to me and show me all the little places that goes I could but I I, I think you appreciate it is highly Very complex and so complex that at times uh, even learned people who play in the space can't yeah. understand. Well, certainly I can't explain it, and, and that's my point, is it's yes. so non-transparent. We don't know where this money is going, but certainly um, we know that the pharmacy benefit managers are taking 50 to 75 cents of, of that dollar, and you're only getting 10% of it. It, it. I would like to know where the rest of it goes. Then I'll go back to Mr. Werner. Similarly, uh, with, with your drug, with Eliquis, what type of, what percent of that list price do you think that you all are taking home? Senator, it's a, it's a relatively smaller percentage. As I mentioned before, we've paid over the last five years about $100 billion in rebates and discounts, and the majority of that go to one product, and that's Eloquus. Okay. Um, go back to Mr. Davis. Let's talk about you, you all have an antiviral drug that's been, a, been approved. Um, how many drugs did you, did, did you go down? As, when COVID hit, you were trying to develop multiple drugs. How many have made it across the finish line? What did you spend on R&D as you look at those all together? Yeah, so we, when, uh, when the COVID situation hit, we uh, drove two uh, or four key programs, two in vaccines, uh, two in antivirals. Um, only one of those succeeded, which is the drug Legevrio. Uh, the s total spend across uh, those four programs is a little over $2.5 billion. So you spent $2.5 billion. You got one across the finish line, an antiviral. Is that being used in the United States? Uh, it, very little. It, it has emergency use authorization. It never got to full approval, and so we're actually seeing it being used much more outside the United States. So in actuality, you spent $2.5 billion and got none uh, of significant market share in the United States despite that. Uh, Mr. Wado, I'll, I'll talk to you for a second. Um, in my 25 years taking care of patients, we were always able to find a solution for their drugs that they needed. 340B programs, um, rebates, um, there's always exceptions to the rules, but what type of efforts does J&J &J make to work with 340B programs and to help, help some of these people that need help? Thank you, sir. We, we, we care deeply about patient affordability, but also we care about the sustainability of the uh, rural hospitals and the small hospitals that take care of patients that uh, are underserved. So we believe that the 340B program, uh, it's an important program to support those hospitals, and we are fully... Uh, fully looking forward to collaborate with them uh, in any way we can to support past patient access on those hospitals. And I'm going to point out once again, it's just not rural hospitals, it's our community health centers are taking great advantage of the 340B program as well, trying to make sure that every patient in America has access to primary care, true affordable access to primary care, plus having access to affordable drugs as, as well. Um, I might make a couple quick points. The people of Kansas sent me here to save Medicare. To save Medicare, I need a miracle drug to treat Alzheimer's. It seems to me that Americans bear the burden of most of the R&D in this world, and other countries benefit from it. And that impacts the price in, in many ways as well. Mr. Davis, am I wrong? Does, why does it feel like to me that Americans are peeling most of the brunt of the R&D cost? Or is that not accurate? I don't know. Well, I think, Senator, it gets down to, as you look across the, the globe, um, different markets, and, and I appreciate what the U.S. does. I think the U.S. favors innovation. It values it. It values access for our patients, fast access, most access. Many markets around the world 
um, don't do that. What they focus on more is their budget and how do they meet, meet those budget needs. And we appreciate the budgetary constraints that everyone faces. But as a result of that, often the patients aren't getting access to meds. They don't get them as fast, which we've commented on today. And it's harder to see how you can support the innovation we need to do in Thank that you. situation. Thank you. Senator Baldwin. Senator Casey. Thanks so much, Senator Baldwin, for, for allowing me to jump ahead. Mr. Chairman, thanks for the hearing. I want to start with, with a, a sense of, that I have back home. When I talk to people in Pennsylvania, and a lot of your companies have a lot of interest in Pennsylvania, I hear over and over again, this problem, the cost of prescription drugs, it's like a, it's like a bag of heavy rocks. It's been, people have been carrying this around on their shoulders every day, year after year. And they're tired of it. And they don't, they don't believe that any, any player in this is doing enough. Uh, I think they're, most Pennsylvanians are happy that, uh, that I could vote for a bill in 2022 that allowed Medicare to negotiate for lower prescription drug costs and that we could cap the cost of insulin, 35 bucks a month for Medicare Part D beneficiaries. They're happy that we could cap the out-of-pocket costs. That'll go into effect about a year from now, but but they're not happy. They're they're not satisfied that even Congress is doing enough, House or Senate or either party. But they're certainly not happy with the the um, the, the level of work that that you've put into this. Uh, look, I hear all this talk about rebates and 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 uh, uh, you know cost reductions you're trying to put in place, but it's not cutting. It's not cutting back home. And when I talk to people that, that uh, see what PBMs are doing, they know that they're not, not meeting the obligation that they, they would expect them to. So uh, there's no question that, that your companies and, and big pharmaceutical companies are playing a role in this. You bear a measure of responsibility in this. And um, I wanted to ask you a couple questions about that. First and foremost, tell me what concrete steps, very specific steps, that each of you are taking and your companies are taking to make sure that we can get these costs down. And, and even, even by way of repetition, you may have already said it, I'm not worried about you repeating yourself, but we need to know specifically what you're doing to lower costs so that no one, especially someone who needs a life-saving intervention, a life-saving treatment, is going to be denied that solely, solely because of cost. And I'll start on the left, Mr. Duato, going left to right. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. We absolutely want to be part of the solution. We understand that copay obligations for U.S. patients are burdensome, and it does create health inequities. What are we doing for that? We have a very extensive patient assistance program that for commercial patients enables them to be able to pay low copays, five to fifteen dollars per month. We supported more than one million patients in 2022 with our copay assistance programs. If a patient is underinsured or not insured, we provide free drug. We gave three point nine billion dollars in free drug in 2022. But I think we can do more and we can work together in order to lower out of pocket costs for patients even in Medicare, as you mentioned, because that's a real need that we are committed, all our employees are committed, in order to make sure that our medicines get to the patients that they deserve it. Mr. Davis. Well, Senator, very much like uh, J&J, we have um, tiered levels of patient assistance programs because we want to make sure that patients who need our drugs can access them. If you have insurance uh, but you fall below uh, certain means where you're not able to handle your copay, we will give copay assistance to those patients through a program we run. If you're someone who doesn't have insurance, is not able to qualify for government programs, we have a patient assistance program that, apply, uh, that basically provides the drugs for free. Uh, so we are very much focused on this and making sure that we can do everything we can and we're investing uh, a lot of money on it. But something I'd like to add, because I think it's important to the discussion, we're, we're focusing on prices today, but we also need to think about innovation as a way to fix the problem. And something we're focusing on, on as a company is a new technology called microcyclic peptides. 
that allow us to potentially take what historically has been large molecules, difficult to make, expensive drugs, difficult to deliver, and we're starting to show the capability to convert those into cheaper small molecule forms, oral forms. If we're able to do that, we have one in late stage development now called an oral PCSK9, which is for heart disease, but we're looking to do that for others. We're investing millions, billions behind that effort. So I think we need to also think about how can innovation solve the problem. We need to address the price challenges today. We have to lower out-of-pocket costs. But innovation like, ultimately is what's going to help us fix this. Sure. Senator, maybe I would highlight three things. First, um, we obviously have a very robust on the commercial side copay assistance program that brings out-of-pocket costs down in, in many cases for certainly our oral oncologics, for example, almost to zero. They're complex at times, so we are working very hard to make those more universally available. That's step one. Step two, we would like to work with this Congress to find ways in which we could apply the same sort of programs in Medicare. There's some complexities. We want to make sure we're not diverting from the use of generics, for example, but we think there are potential ways that we could do that, and we would love to explore those opportunities with Congress to bring out-of-pocket costs down for Medicare patients. The second thing I would say is we are looking at doing more innovative work, innovative contracting work, where we can, for example, if our drug works, we get paid. If it doesn't work, we get paid less, and in some cases, maybe even got not get paid at all. There are technicalities in the U.S. that prohibit us from doing that more in the U.S. We want to work to get those removed. The third thing, just building on what, what Rob was saying, is we do believe that innovation plays a role here. Cellular therapy, while not gene therapy per the previous question, those are expensive therapies. We have got to bring those costs down, and the way we will do that is we will innovate to the next generation, which hopefully is way less complex than what I described previously. Well, I'll be submitting some, some more follow-up questions for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Senator Paul. I'm not an apologist for big pharma. In fact, when corporations manipulate government to their advantage, crony capitalism, I'm an unfettered critic. But in defense of capitalism, I am a consistent, unapologetic advocate. Milton Friedman once wrote that if you want to create a shortage of tomatoes, just pass a law that retailers can't sell tomatoes for more than two cents. Instantly, you'll have a tomato shortage. I might also add that that's true of prescription drugs. Virtually every shortage of drugs that we've seen in the last few years involves price controls that drive out production of the drug. One reason the United States leads in pharmaceutical innovation is because while the U.S. adhered to more, a more market-based pricing and rewarded innovators, Europe adopted stringent price controls in the 1980s and 90s. It's not surprising that we lead the world in innovation, and Europe does not. But unfortunately, this committee and this hearing is not here to celebrate American success. Instead, the majority drags us to conduct a show trial to harangue companies challenging the Inflation Reduction Act's price controls in court. They've simply brought forward people who questioned their partisan legislation. Ten years ago, the five-year survival rate for, for patients diagnosed with advanced lung cancer was 5%. Terrible. Since Merck introduced the cancer drug Keytruda in 2014, the survival rate has grown nearly fourfold, 5% to 20%. We should be celebrating that instead of castigating people and telling them how to run their business and why, don't you, why are you buying your stock back? I have a friend with a genetic predisposition to cancer. He's alive today because of Keytruda. We should be celebrating that. Johnson & Johnson's Remicade was the first monoclonal antibody approved for treating chronic conditions like Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis. Since its approval, Remicade has revolutionized treatments for inflammatory disease, made remission a reality for patients with debilitating conditions, and paved the way for development of other autoimmune treatments. When I began in medicine, virtually all patients with rheumatoid arthritis you could see from a distance had crippling, disfiguring arthritis in their hands. Now today it's rarely seen because of the advances of American companies under an American system that allowed profit to occur. In 1987, Merck pledged to, no to donate the entire stock of its drug, ivermectin, to those suffering from river blindness. Nearly 37 years later, 
ivermectin donation program treats 300 million people annually with over 11 billion treatments shipped to endemic countries. This is charity, my friends, from capitalism. You don't get this under socialism because there is no profit under socialism. They have no money to give. They make extraordinary profits. Do they keep some up for their investors? Yeah, that's what they're supposed to do. But they also have some left over for charity, and you don't get that under socialism. Because of Merck's donations, seven countries eradicated the transmission of the number one cause of blindness in the world. Pharmaceutical innovation has improved cancer rates, cured hepatitis C, doubled the life uh, span of patients living with cystic fibrosis. It goes on and on. We've tried price controls in general here. We did it in the 1970s under a Republican president, under Nixon. It was a disaster and it led to lines at the gas pump. It was an ultimate disaster. A study at the University of Chicago found that 254 fewer drug approvals over the course of 18 years would happen under price controls. Under communism, they knew this. Socialism, communism, under economic system of socialism. From, from price controls, it became a running joke. In Poland, during the Soviet era, there was a story of the guy went to the store. He was looking for eggs, and he asked the clerk, is this the store with no eggs? And they said, no, this is the store with no toilet paper. The store with no eggs is across the street. That's the story of socialism. That's the story of price controls. Secure, scarcity and empty shells are the inevitable result of price controls. Those who understand and appreciate capitalism do not need a show trial to dupe them into forgetting that price controls have never worked and never will. Let's get back to profitability. I don't think you guys did a very good job on answering this. Did you add into your estimate of whether it's profitable in Canada, whether or not it costs you $2.6 billion on average to develop it. You're talking about manufacturing costs. You're talking about how much it costs to make Contrude and how much you sell it for to say you have a profit in Canada. Do you think it would still be a profit, Mr. Davis, if you added in all the R&D, the $2.6 billion to get it through this system, all your, the apparatus of your company, and you divided all of that out for profitability? Would it still be profitable in most of these other countries? I have not done that analysis, but I would say that the profitability um, would be marginal at best. Do you think you'd have as much R&D if the whole world were Canada? Do you think you'd be developing dozens of new drugs every year if the whole world were Canada? No, I do not. So this is what we're arguing against. You know, sure, you can make it for pennies now, but it didn't start that way. And then people are like, oh, my, it costs so much in the beginning. That's capitalism. That's the way it works in capitalism. Joseph Schumpeter talked about this. And he said, this is a, uh, an old anecdote, but he said, the miracle of capitalism is not that queens have silk stockings, but that factory girls ultimately do. But in the beginning, only the queen has silk stockings. Rich people get stuff in the beginning. Rich people drive the innovation. The first calculators that came out, $300 for adding, subtracting, and dividing machine. Now they're like pennies or free. But you have to allow the price to be higher in the beginning, and the market brings it down as you have more widespread market. That's capitalism. We don't know what the correct price is. There is no moral price. There is no moral amount of profit. There is no business of any of y'all telling them how much stock to buy back. Their job is to make a profit. It's actually against the law for them not to maximize their profit. For, to, for you to sit in judgment of how much profit they should make and how they should run their companies, you know nothing of running companies. You know, nobody up here, maybe some, but almost nobody up here has run big companies, billion-dollar companies. And you presume somehow to say you're going to tell these people how to run their company. List price versus net price. List price means absolutely nothing. I charged $1,800 for cataract surgery. The government paid me $600. Two-thirds of it, nobody stole that. It disappeared because it never existed. So if I build a million dollars in charges, I really was only billing 300000 because that's what I was getting paid. But because of the confusing nature of the system, the list price is much different than the net. But to quote list price and then compare it to net price in other countries is completely and profoundly unfair. The list price means absolutely nothing. All of these fallacies need to be addressed before we begin haranguing American CEOs. Thank you. Thank you for your questioning, Senator Hassan. I'm next. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, uh, Senator Baldwin, I'm sorry. She, oh, I yielded to Senator Casey. I know, but I was. Oh. oh. Is that right? All right. No. Senator Hassan, go and then Senator Baldwin. Uh, thank you. Um, 
so I just wanted to say uh, at the outset that the last time I checked, when a buyer and seller negotiate for a price, that's capitalism. Uh, and I wanted to uh, talk with all three of our distinguished witnesses today because one of the things that strikes me that we are struggling with is I think at various times in each one of your statements, you talked about your price reflecting uh, the value of your product. And the thing is, human health and life is priceless. So if that's the metric here, you will always have an excuse for charging increasing prices for these life-saving drugs. And what we are trying to do here is figure out how you can continue the innovation that Senator Paul just so eloquently spoke about. I would suspect that every member up here has a family member whose life has been saved by innovation innovative medications um, or greatly improved. But at the end of the day, we have to find a way to allow you all to innovate, but also to make sure that the market here and the system here works for the very people whose lives you are helping to save. So I want to start with a question to you, Mr. Davis. While families in New Hampshire and across the country struggle to afford these life-saving medications. Pharmaceutical companies are doing everything that they can to keep their prices and their profits sky high. And I know you've all talked about that not being the case, but let's just look at one thing here. One way that companies do this is by filing dozens, even hundreds, of frivolous patents that lock in their exclusive right to sell their drug for decades. By playing games like this with the patent system, companies block low-cost alternatives like generics from coming to market. Mr. Davis, the list price for Merck's cancer medication, Keytruda, is, as we've talked about, $190,000 per year. Can you tell us how many patents have been filed on this medication? I don't have the exact number, um, but I would focus you on probably the, the most important patents which are the composition of matter patents. In addition to that, well, we have formulation and manufacturing patents. There is one suite of, of, of uh, composition of matter patents that we have, and those are what allow us to continue to have exclusivity. Well, well I don't think it would surprise you to learn that I do know how many patents uh, you currently have. It's 168. This is what this looks like, sheet after sheet after sheet. Patent office records show uh, that not only do you have 168, but half of them relate to the process Merck uses to manufacture the drug, not the way that the drug is used to treat patients. Merck is using patent gimmicks and loopholes to delay other companies from selling lower cost versions of this medication, all while raising the price of Keytruda in the US year after year. So it would be good if Merck would just stop blocking patient access to low-cost medications by using the patent system in this way. It's clear that Merck and other pharmaceutical companies, you are not alone, won't stop abusing the patent system to keep their prices high. So it's clear we also need to take action on that, and that's something we can do. Uh, Senator Braun and I have a bill called the Medication Affordability and Patent Integrity Act, which would help break up these patent walls. And I would urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support that. Now, Mr. Duato, in your testimony, you mentioned that Johnson & Johnson provides financial assistance to uninsured patients in the United States. However, the barriers to access these programs are unreasonably high. For an expensive medication like your company's arthritis drug, Stellara, what does a patient have to do to get assistance from the Johnson & Johnson program? Thank you. We care deeply about patient access, and we put a lot of work in developing uh, well and wide patient assistance programs. And we have mechanism for patients to connect with us via um, a mechanism like a website called Janssen Care Path in which patients can access uh, patient assistance. We supported 1.1 million people with patient copay assistance last year. Well, let me just talk a little bit about that. The initial application, which I have here, is six pages long and it requires pages of additional documents for income verification. In the fine print, this document even requires the patient to consent to a credit report check 
and other financial disclosures. Mr. DeWatto, everyone on this dais wants you to charge a fair price for your company's medications. But if someone does need assistance paying for their medication, this process has to be streamlined and easily available to anyone who qualifies. So I would urge you to look personally at this application. When somebody is dealing with a serious illness, the last thing they need to do is read the fine print and decide that they have to disclose a credit report, the relevance of which kind of escapes me. Um, Mr. Berner and Mr. Duato, we could also increase competition by making it easier for generic drugs to get approved. Mr. Berner, let's turn to the BMS stroke prevention drug, Eliquis. The list price, as we've talked about, is $7,100 per year. How many generics of this drug could a patient in the United States get at the pharmacy today? Senator, in the U.S., there are not yet generics available. Right. There are zero generic versions of Eliquis available to patients, even though the original patents on the medication began to sunset in 2019, because your company has sued to block two approved generics from the U.S. market until 2028 at the earliest. Isn't that right? Senator, we have um, allowed for generic entry in 2028. That's correct. Right. So we have two generics ready to go. Your original patent is well past expired, but you still are actively trying to prevent generics from coming to market. Uh, Mr. Duato, the list price of Johnson & Johnson's autoimmune arthritis medication Stelera is nearly $80,000 annually. Similar to Eliquis, there are currently zero low-cost biosimilar versions of Stelera available to U.S. patients. There are zero biosimilars for Stelera available in the United States today because Johnson & Johnson has also sued to delay the launch of a low-cost biosimilar drug. So we need, you know, you have all talked about the need to have speed of access, and Mr. Chair, I'm wrapping right up. Speed to, of access, getting drugs to market, but then you are actively working to block the less expensive biosimilars and generics to come to market, and that's something we should address. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Romney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and appreciate uh, these executives uh, taking time away from your uh, responsibilities at your respective companies to, to be here and to inform us and in some cases to get berated by us and, and give us an opportunity to pontificate on our various topics, which I'm about to do. Uh, one, one is that, that um, I, uh, I fully concur with, uh, with Mr. Paul or Senator Paul uh, indicated just a moment ago, Rand Paul, um, and that is that a free enterprise system works marvelously. And I know we keep asking you, you know, what are you doing to try and reduce the prices of your products? The answer is that's not what happens in free enterprise in capitalism. I hope it doesn't come as a shock to my colleagues. In capitalism, if you're running an enterprise where you have a fiduciary responsibility to your owners, you try and get as high a price as you can. That's what you try and do. You try and make as much profit as you can. That's how free enterprise works. You think Chevrolet sits back? and says, gosh, how can we get the price of the Chevrolet down? No, it's like, how high a price can I get and maximize the profit for my shareholder? What price does McDonald's charge for a sandwich? As high a price as they can get. But the amazing thing about free enterprise is that someone figured out that if everybody does that and you have competition among all the players, that somehow the prices come down and the quality goes up and the access to the product is broader. It's the marvel, it, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, but it's the marvel of capitalism. Now, obviously, wise companies say, well, you don't just raise prices to the roof uh, and, and, and do things that are gonna harm your credibility and the trust in the marketplace and have your employees not wanna work there because they're gonna figure they're working for bad people. So wise enterprises don't just do all the things I just mentioned. They also say we're gonna do other things and care for the poor and, and care for people who wanna come work in our company. We do those things too. But recognize free enterprises about enterprises battling each other with higher prices in many cases and then they get pushed out by people, develop new products and put them out of business. It's, it's how it works. But let me turn to, I mean, and I know, as Senator Paul indicated, there's some who'd like price controls. There's some who'd like socialized medicine. And it's like, have you seen what that produce, it produces? It doesn't produce new drugs. 
It doesn't produce cures. It, it sounds great. We're going to set up, price controls is just another name for capitalism, excuse me, socialism light. Our system works, but there are ways to improve it. And I'm very concerned that this disparity between list price and what you actually get paid is a problem. And I, I don't know why it's a problem or what we can do about it. But do you have PBMs and uh, getting prices and discounts like this in other countries that you compete in? Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, Berner, yeah. uh, Senator, we do not. This is a unique element of the U.S. health care system. Is, is that true for you also, Mr. That Dave? is true for us as well. Uh, and Mr. Caro, is that also true? This is unique. The inequity that exists in the U.S. is because of that we have higher out-of-pocket costs for patients than anywhere else in the developed world. So I hope we focus on this. We may not have the right bad guys here, all right? These are the guys developing cures and helping people solve disease, diseases. But, but we have something here they don't have in the rest of the world. These PBMs that want higher and higher list prices because they get paid based on how high the list price is because they get a percent of the list price. I'm not sure where all the money goes. Some of it goes back to patients. Some goes to the companies if they're self-insured. I don't know where it all goes, but I think that's the issue. So let me ask each of you, uh, if you were in our shoes, knowing what you knew, no, what, what should we be doing to try and get the cost of products down to our, uh, to the people of the country and to the country at large, to the government that buys a lot of, a, a lot of goods, a lot of drugs? What, what should we be focused on? And, and I, I know that you sell to PBM, so you've got to be careful not to step on their toes too hard because they might punish you. But, but what, what advice would you give us? What should we be looking at? Where's the, where's the problem in this, uh, in this mess? We'll start, start here, Mr. Berner. Um, maybe three things I would offer up, Senator. Yeah. First, um, to the complexity that you just described, number one, de-link profits from intermediaries from the list price of the drug and the rebates, rather, that are provided. If you could de-link that, that would be important. And alternatively, um, require that those rebates be passed on to lower out-of-pocket costs for patients. That's number one. Number two, I, I firmly believe we have the ability to help lower out-of-patient costs in Medicare if we could provide the same types of copay support that we do on the commercial side to Medicare patients. That would be a second thing. And the third thing, we've referenced it before, we do innovative contracting outside of the U.S. where we get paid if our product works. There are constraints on our ability to do that in the U.S. I would like to see those removed. That would be very helpful. Great. Thank you. Mr. Davis? I would say that I, Chris basically covered all of the things we would also look to, to do. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. I, I, three things, as Mr. Berner, I would make sure that the rebates and discounts that we pay to PBMs go back to patients to reduce out-of-pocket costs. I will make sure that, as we are trying to do, and I know this committee is looking into that, would delink the compensation of the PBMs from the lease price. And finally, I would sit down to see what we can do to provide a, a patient assistance program for patients in Medicare Part D, but also look to further lower the out-of-pocket costs for patients that the IRA is bringing. Thank you. I, you did mention the fact that the PBMs are largely owned by the insurance companies. So sometimes we think PBMs are going to be lowering our costs as an employer, let's say, and you hire a PBM to lower your cost. But it, it might lower your cost, but then, then it's passing on their profit to the insurance company. Is that a problem? Is the fact that the PBMs are owned by the insurance companies, is that a problem here? Uh, is that something we need to look at as well? Do any of you have any comment on that? The, the three PBMs are owned by the three largest insurance companies, and together they control about 80% of the market of the prescriptions in the U.S. Yeah, I'm a big believer in, in free enterprise, as you can tell by my opening comments. At the same time, I'm concerned that we've got some structures here that are anti-competitive and make markets less effective, and we probably ought to focus on some of those. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Senator Baldwin. Thank you. Um, it's been very interesting to listen to uh, the back and forth, uh, Senator Romney. Uh, uh, your points about... Uh, uh, you know, support of the free market, but understanding that there are times when there's market failures. We also have an obligation, I think, to oversee because uh, uh, our committee, with the fi along with the finance committee, um, oversee and uh, need to have good stewardship of Medicare and Medicare dollars. Um, but uh, 
the point that um, Senator Romney just made about basically, I don't know, I can't follow the dollars and it's complex, is a real issue. Um, I want to start just by sharing uh, some of my constituent struggles. Um, I have a constituent who literally turns down the heat in the winter because that's how she is able to afford the prescription drugs she needs for her wellness. Um, uh, there are um, choices that people are making. Uh, people are rationing their medication. People are foregoing their medication because of affordability. Um, I think we need more transparency. And I think we need more transparency uh, to inform the policies that we uh, adopt. I was pleased this last May that this committee advanced my bipartisan Fair Drug Pricing Act, which I lead with Senator Braun. Our bill would require basic transparency from your companies at any juncture in which you want to raise the price, uh, uh, list price of uh, a prescription drug by more than a certain amount, a certain percentage. Asking questions like, what is the cost to manufacture the product? What do you invest in R&D, something we really support? How much are you spending on marketing and advertising? What are you doing in terms of stock buybacks? Is there excessive executive compensation? I agree that we also have to have that transparency within the PBMs. Um, I remember uh, uh, under the last uh, president, um, when we were having our confirmation hearing for the, uh, his secretary, his, uh, Secretary Azar, who came out of the pharmaceutical industry. And I shared uh, with him uh, a, a letter from a constituent who has two diabetic sons, just talking about the costs every month, not just the insulin, but the test strips, et cetera. And I said, what do I tell this dad about the high cost, which had just, by the way, increased significantly. And he just responded, it's complicated. I can't tell my constituent, well, we can't address this because it's complicated. I remember uh, when, uh, when uh, this is years ago now, when uh, the EpiPen doubled in price overnight, went from $100 basically to $200. My constituents uh, certainly told me what a burden that was. I asked if you could show me, follow the money, a chart, follow the money. Nobody could. We need additional transparency to inform our, uh, our policies. So, Mr. Duato, the, the price of Stellara in the U.S. is $79,000 a year. Um, by the way, in Wisconsin, the median household income is 72000 Your company has made twice as much uh, selling this uh, arthritis treatment in the U.S. than it did in the rest of the world combined. This is going back to 2016. Under the Fair Drug Pricing Act, you would need to account for this exceptionally high cost. So, just to look at one component of what I'm talking about, how much does Johnson & Johnson spend on marketing and advertising for this particular drug? Senator, thank you for the question. We publish every year, since six years ago, uh, a report that we call a transparency report, and we explain our pricing practices, and we give transparency also to the different intermediaries that play into the model. We disclose our advertising uh, expenses and our R&D expenses. What I can tell you is that in 2022, which was the last year that our report was published and is available, we spent double in R&D, 110% more in R&D than we did in sales and marketing. Um, do you know what that dollar figure is for sales? And I don't have it top of my hand, but I will swear to follow up with you to Thank give it you. to you, but it was double the amount in R&D than we did the spend in sales and marketing. Well, um, let's, uh, let's look at uh, Mr. Borner. Um, the price of Eloquist is, in the U.S., has increased by $4,000 since its launch. In other countries, the cost of this drug is decreasing. How much did your company spend on R&D last year? 
our company spent just over $9 billion last year on R&D. And, and then how much did your company spend on stock buybacks, dividends, and executive compensation last year? I don't have that exact figure, Senator, um, but Does we... Does $12.7 billion sound right from the HELP study? That's, that's roughly correct. Okay. Um, for the first time, uh, thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, Medicare will negotiate the price of drugs, including Eliquist and Stellara, and this is really welcome news for families in Wisconsin, but the truth is it's really not enough, and my constituents should not be forced to decide if they should turn the heat on in winter or buy the medication they need, all while uh, companies are raking in literally tens of millions of dollars or billions. Uh, uh, we have more work to do. Thank you. Senator Collins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think all of us could agree that when a doctor prescribes a needed medication, that cost should not be an insurmountable barrier uh, to the patient using it. Yet, for more than half of the adults in my state, according to a survey, it is a barrier. They're worried about affording the cost of prescription drugs. And in the last year, nearly one out of three Maine adults reported skipping a dose of medicine, cutting pills in half, or not filling a prescription because of cost. I talked to a young woman with type 1 diabetes who, after she aged out of her parents' um, insurance, started cutting back on her insulin. She ended up in the emergency room and was gravely ill because of that. She felt she just couldn't afford it and took a very unwise chance. So this is a huge problem. But another aspect of this discussion is that many new medications represent true breakthroughs, disease-modifying therapies or even cures. And the other part is that literally billions of dollars are invested in developing drugs that end up to not be successful. So I think we have to balance all of these concerns. These new drugs often cost more, but if they have the potential to reduce the number of unnecessary hospitalizations and lead to better patient outcomes, they may be worth it. For disorders like Alzheimer's, the breakthrough drugs can help keep patients ha healthier and active longer, benefiting society as well as their families. For example, I've heard of a patient being diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment early enough that the patient was able to benefit from a newly available treatment and actually return to the workforce. That's quite an accomplishment. Now, last year, the chairman criticized uh, the, this particular company for a list price of $26,500 per year, even after the company, in a really unprecedented fashion, issued a lengthy analysis of the process by which they arrived at the price. Still, sticker shock around list prices and speculative claims that certain therapies will bankrupt the Medicare program have contributed to restrictive coverage policies, patient confusion, and limited uptake. So I would like, uh, Mr. Davis, you to discuss how we can balance the need to have affordable medications without hampering innovation and how access to the next, what would be the impact on access to the next generation of medications if price controls like those in Europe are implemented? How do you see a solution to the balance between 
affordability and innovation. Yes. So, Senator, thank you for the question. You know, I, I would start with, you know, at, at Merck and what are the principles we apply when we think about how we price drugs? Um, because I think it also gets to some of the other questions that have been asked about what stops you from just raising your price. And, and I can tell you that uh, as a company, and this goes back to the core of who we are over 130 years and, and is truly the purpose we live by, and that is we look at several elements. We look at what is the benefit to the patient, but equally we do look at what is the benefit or the cost to the system. We look at access and affordability, and I can tell you, for instance, when we launched uh, Catruda, we launched at parity to market price, even though we knew we had a better uh, product, in part because we wanted to ensure access. Um, and so we look at all of that, and then we look at what does it take to absorb the cost of all the failed drugs. We know 90% of all drugs we will bring into the clinic fail. The reality of it is the drugs that make it have to fund that failure. In the case of Merck, it's just interesting, uh, I think, to point out, since 2014, the minority of drugs we have launched have actually even returned their cost of R&D, the minority. Uh, I'm sorry, the majority have not returned their cost of R&D. So it means that when you do get the rare drug that succeeds, it has to help cover that. So that's what we're, we're facing in the system. But as we look at how can we fix this, I think we have to get to the out-of-pocket cost, and we have to find a way to really uh, drive that down and then continue to find ways to bring better access through the types of uh, access programs we've all talked about here, whether it's um, uh, through patient assistance programs, copay assistance, all of the ways we can help the individual person address that affordability challenge, which we all know someone who's faced that, and I don't want to see anyone face that. NIH uh, provides a lot of assistance in the research that in some times partners with pharmaceutical companies. How is the fact that there has been federal help, for example, in the development of the COVID vaccines, uh, how does that factor into the pricing? Well, you know, and obviously, as we look at the system, the ecosystem we live in, um, it is important to understand that all players are important. So the, the role of the NIH is important. The, the NIH basically uh, does the basic research. If you will, uh, they provide uh, the lock, uh, but they don't have the key. We, we provide the key. We take that basic research, we sculpt it into a molecule. We, we were able to say, now that we know a target of disease to go after, how do we do it? And then we spend our resources in the most expensive part of the development and the riskiest part, which is the clinical development, to ensure safety and efficacy to bring the drug to market. So we need all players in the ecosystem. And if I could ask you to start to wrap up for Senator yes. Smith. Um, I, it's important that we do that. And so I think as you look in the COVID vaccine situation, um, we didn't have, we did not receive any federal funding for what we did. We spent all of our own resources at risk. Uh, we commented it was two and a half billion. We did that at risk. Uh, but one of the programs we did do, Legabrio, did have um, some basis from the NIH, and they were compensated for that. On, Thank you. on behalf of the chairman, Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks to all of you for being uh, with us here today. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to start with you, Mr. Davis. Um, could you tell us how much Merck spends on advertising every year? So if you look in the United States, um, our direct-to-consumer advertising is about $350 million. And then also direct-to-medical providers? I don't have that. I wouldn't know that enough. We can come back to you on that one. Okay. I think it's approximately $2 billion um, overall is what I think is what worldwide. That's a worldwide number. Pardon me for that. I don't recognize that number, but we can come back to you. Okay. Okay. And so, um, you know, one thing I bet most of us on this panel could agree with is that um, nobody likes that advertising. Doctors don't like it. Patients don't like it. Um, apparent, I know that the American Medical Association has called for a ban on direct-to-consumer advertising. So could you just address this issue? And I think it's also true that you sued to prevent regulations that would require you to, to disclose the list prices in that advertising. Could you address that? Yes, I'm happy to do that, Senator. So, you know, direct consumer advertising um, serves an important purpose. There's been studies that have shown that it drives better adherence. 
It drives patients to understand the use of their medications, and it, and it overall will bring benefits to the health system. So I do believe there's a valid educational piece to direct-to-consumer advertising, and I also believe we need to be full and fair and transparent in helping people understand the cost of drugs. The reason we uh, brought suit, the one you're referring to, was our concern that the specific request or, that was in that was that you show the list price of the drug. And our concern, based on all the conversations we've had here this morning, is that that can often be very misleading and, in fact, could cause patients not to seek the drug when, in reality, take Genuvia as an example, if we put on an advertisement that it's $6,900 when, in reality, if you take the total in the system, it's $690. I would hate to think someone doesn't show up to get that medicine because they don't understand the price. What we supported instead, which is what we do today, in all of our direct consumer advertising, we drive you to a site that gives our list price, it gives all of the rebates we provide so that you can see it and we give further information and education. We think that is a more effective tool and a more accurate tool to stop the misperceptions that exist. That's why we raise that, that concern. One of the things that I think is really confusing for patients is to try to figure out what, you know, how, you know, how much things cost in the health system overall, including in prescription medications. And um, so let me just ask you, and I'm going to um, ask you about this, um, Dr. Berner. How much would acute myeloid leukemia patient, how much would that patient pay every month for your drug, um, Adifa, the cancer treatment? That if, let's say, they had a 20% coinsurance responsibility. Senator, I don't have that exact figure off the top of my head. What I can say is that for most of our oral oncologic drugs, we're able, as on the commercial side, to bring copays down to a very low amount and in many cases to zero. Now, to a point that was raised earlier, we have to do more to make that more widely available and an easier process to actually get into those programs, and we're working on that. We've been doing that since I became CEO in November, and that's something we're committed to. And again, I'd like to be able to provide that same benefit on the Medicare side. So, but if you have a list price that is, and I, and I get what you all are saying about the list price is just the list price, that isn't necessarily what people pay, but if you have a list price and then you have a coinsurance responsibility that's a percentage of the list price, that could still be quite a significant amount of money. I mean, I think it could be, you know, in, in this case, um, you know, $6,800 a month for this medication. Senator, what you're pointing out is absolutely why we believe we've got to also look at ways to bring that list price down. We've been discussing at length this sort of the complexity and the intermediaries play in this system that lead to incentives to drive those list prices up. But unquestionably, because out-of-pocket costs and coinsurance, for example, are typically tied to that list price, we have to find ways to bring that list price down. Well, I would agree with that. I think that that um, is a really significant issue, particularly as I think some of my colleagues have pointed out that when you um, get to these patient assistance programs, they're, um, they're quite confusing and hard to, um, hard to navigate through. And I think that um, sometimes that's only available if you have commercial insurance. And if you don't have commercial insurance, then you could really be flat out of luck. Senator, that's correct. And in fact, I referenced that since I became CEO, one of the things we've done on the commercial side is really begun to look at how, how, much, how many hoops do patients have to go through to get access to these copay support programs. You know, we've provided $2.5 billion in copay support programs over the last five years as a company, provided $12 billion in free product. Um, but we've got to make it easier and more universally available for commercial patients to get access to that. Again, there are some constraints to us being able to provide those services on the Medicare side. There's some very legitimate concerns to providing those on the Medicare side because you don't want to obviously be diverting patients from, for example, generic products onto these as a result of the, onto branded products as a result of this. But we would love to work with members of Congress to find ways to do this constructively. And is it, is it uh, true that um, the cost of those patient assistance programs you can then turn around and deduct on your taxes to lower your tax liability? Senator, I don't know the answer to that, but I can follow up. Okay. Um, I want to get at the question. I just have a minute left, and so let me see if I can do this really quickly. Um, one of the challenges that we have are some pretty often pretty severe shortages in medications. 
And um, I have heard so many stories about this from Minnesota um, folks who um, there's, they have a preferred treatment for a, a disease and then the um, drug is not available. So I want to ask you all, um, just I'll cut to the chase on this. Um, Senator Collins and Senator Murkowski and I have a piece of legislation that would require reporting of supply chain disruptions that could lead to shortages um, in medications. And I'd like to know whether you all would support that um, concept to help people understand where these shortages are and where they're, the, the, the root chemicals for their medications are coming from. We work very, <coughs> excuse me, we work very closely with the drug shortage office at the FDA and we're constantly doing all efforts to dual source the entire supply chain of our medicines so there's no discontinuations in our supply. And I'm not familiar with the specifics of the bill, but I would say in general the more we can continue to help understand what are the shortage issues, we should address that. But I think we've got to get at the fundamental issues of why do we have a shortage in the first place. I can tell you in our example, uh, we make a drug called Tyspeed. And, and again, okay, you're sorry. over time, so could, could you take those answers for the record, Senator? I would be Smith? happy to, Senator King. Great. Uh, on behalf of the Chair, Senator Braun. Thank you. I'm going to start with Mr. Davis. Um, what would your definition of a free market be? Uh, one where uh, you are able to bring goods, and if those goods um, bring value, and the system sees value in them, you're able to bring those at a value you think is fair and reasonable and negotiate with the other sides in, in, in a world where you have free competition. So right there you said negotiate. Uh, most free markets are typified by this. And I'd like you all to listen to this because I think the big uh, challenge, if I were in your seat running your companies, is that it's not a free market. A free market means you've got a lot of choices, you've got vibrant competition, no barriers to entry, and you've got an engaged consumer. Now, do any of those apply to your business? I think all of those apply, but I think one thing we need to understand in, our, in the way our business functions, for a period of time, we have exclusivity. That's during the patent protection period. Thereafter, and in that period, we must reap a return on the investments we make to fund the R&D we do. Thereafter, drugs are freely available, and there is total competition in that space. But yet you would sue to keep transparency in terms of what the consumer price would be or the list price. Or you do things like tweak patents. That doesn't happen anywhere else. And... You're not alone there. Hospitals and insurance companies do all this stuff behind closed doors as well. So I would think if I were in your shoes, you've got maybe a few years before, so none of that stuff really applies to you guys as I listed it. You might try to spin it that way, but it's not the case. I fixed it in my own business back in, oh, probably 15, 16 years ago, by creating healthcare consumers, by trying to avoid the system through wellness and prevention, which you don't hear much about. But when you do need it, it's got to be to where you've got a lot of options. And I understand you're a little different in terms of the R&D that goes into it. And then many years ago, you created a monster called the PBM that now is sucking all kinds of money out of the market. Why can't you fix that in terms of doing alternative ways that would just smother the market with transparency and get it into a different channel of distribution. You got a guy like Mark Cuban that's trying to start a company at cost plus. Uh, you're going to probably need to find things like that or you're going to be appearing more often here and it's going to be where you're going to be regulated like, an un like a utility would be. Because in my opinion, you operate more like an unregulated utility, you know, kind of cloak yourselves behind free enterprise, and now it's up to 18 19% of our GDP. Something's got to give. Uh, Senator Sanders talked earlier about uh, things costing 10% uh, to 25% overseas, and I think I heard the excuse was, well, they have price controls. Well... I think I'd be smart enough to know that sooner or later that will occur here. 
It's going to be up to the industry to fix it, and you're probably just 15 to 20 percent of the problem. You could fix the part that you get the most heat for by maybe trying to get more uh, customers like the business Mark Cuban is putting out there that's based upon transparency. If not, you're going to get all the people that don't own health care businesses finally saying we're not going to pay through the private side the insurance system three to four times what it costs through government, and I'll let you complete the logical chain. You're going to have government as your business partner. So uh, why would you persist in a paradigm that looks like you're going to be headed towards what you definitely don't want, and that's doing more business with the federal government. Mr. Davis. Well, I don't want to speculate on, on the systems as a whole. I think what I focus on is what do we need to do to drive the mission of our company, which is in the near term, bring access and affordability, make sure that when we bring affordability, we don't sacrifice access, and often patients lose access when we try to address affordability and that we fund innovation. And, and that's whatever ultimately we come to as a solution. If we can protect those elements, I think we will both help patients of today and we can make the investments. Have you ever looked at having future. some other system of distribution like almost any other manufacturer would have when you make something? You do a pretty good job making the pill. You completely default on how it gets from where you make it to who uses it. You're putting independent pharmacies out of business because of PBMs and other kind of peculiarities in the industry. Have you thought about at least in the place where most people confront the healthcare system uh, with a prescription about trying to restructure that, smother it with transparency and options to where people can get their stuff and then apply that to biologics and the entirety of the spectrum and don't tweak the patents and try to preserve a broken system. Yeah, so, you know, we have considered should we look at going direct. The reality of it is, as a single company, when you have now today three PBMs controlling 80% of the lives in this, in this country, the ability to do that takes a portfolio uh, of characteristics that um, we don't currently have, and I don't believe any one company... Uh, can do that. That's why we continue to believe we need free market. But we I'll do bet if you collectively together. got together with the other drug companies and encouraged others like uh, a cost plus that Mark Cuban has done to where you're going, I think you've got it under your control not to perpetuate uh, a bad situation that was created by you. I mean, you make it. You don't have to necessarily use PBMs. Why don't you encourage an alternative structure? At least show us that you're wanting to compete. Because all I can tell you is that if you don't take it, take the bull by the horns, do something different, you're going to be like all other countries. You're going to be dealing with the federal government as a regulated entity. And I think you could, we could lose some things. But in the meantime, Senator Sanders pointed it out. It costs a lot more here. The health care outcomes are better there, and pharma, hospitals, and insurance better figure it out before it's too late. Senator Hickenlooper. First, I'll echo what Senator Braun said. Second, I'll thank each of you for, for taking the time out. I know how busy you are and appreciate you uh, coming and answering questions. Uh, you know, I grew up, like most of us, I think, looking at um, – our, our pharmaceutical companies as treasures, as companies that America could be rightfully proud of as innovators. Uh, but that's, that's slipping away. Uh, when I'm back in Colorado, uh, I hear a much, let's just be generously, let's be gracious and say a wider dis, a diversity of opinion. Uh, according to a recent YouGov survey, more than a third of Americans were, reported that cost has prevented them from filling a prescription they need. Um, a separate Kaiser Family Foundation poll, uh, this one just from last year, said that 83 percent of Americans rated profits made by pharmaceutical companies as uh, the overwhelming contributing factor to the high cost of prescription drugs. Um, you've all talked about the R&D, the innovation, which there can be no question about that. Uh, but what is the value of these, you know, cutting-edge drugs and therapies if, if so many people can't afford them? And I think that widespread belief that Americans 
feel your companies are too focused on profits. Uh, it, it damages your credibility. I think the, the culture of your businesses the, the, and the culture of your customers. So I want to see how, how you feel about that in terms of the importance of, of people believing in your mission again, or, or believing as strongly that you are, you are good leaders of the mission. Why don't we start with you, Mr. Duato? Thank you, Senator. I can assure you that the 50,000 employees of Johnson & Johnson in the U.S. wake up every day thinking what they can do for patients. And I can represent proudly that sentiment. Uh, what can we do to address uh, the real inequity that exists in the U.S., which is that seniors and patients that need the medicines the most pay higher out-of-pocket costs? In my view, that's the real problem. There are other things that are positive in the U.S. healthcare system, like the access to breakthrough cutting-edge treatments earlier than any other country in the world, but it's true, we have a real inequity there. I think we have to work together in order to address that inequity, and there's multiple ways that we can uh, work on that. One is to make sure that... Just, just give me one, because I want to make sure we, I've got a couple more questions. One is to make sure that the discounts and rebates, we pay $39 billion in 2022, that we pay to the middlemen are passed to the patients so we can lower the out-of-pocket costs. Got it. That's a good one. So, Senator, I appreciate the question, and I can tell you uh, at Merck, we've lived by uh, the statement our, our founder put out that medicines are for the patients, not for the profits. But so long as we've remembered that, the profits follow. And it really says we can both do good and do well for our shareholders together. And there's a balance. And I think what you're talking about is where is the balance? And we are always trying to find that balance, and I'm very much focused on it as the CEO of the company because the legacy of Merck, uh, the, the, the pride of our 70,000 employees and what we do matters to me uh, and a strong belief in the mission of the company. It's why I came to the company and it's why I'm in this industry. So we are very committed to that. But I do think uh, the challenge we continue to face is the structural issues in the system that are creating the problem. Oh, we've heard that. I get yes. it. Senator, the, the challenge that we're facing in this committee today and what we've been discussing is how do we ensure affordability today without sacrificing tomorrow's innovation? That's what we're focused on. We've got to make sure we do what you've heard from all of us are bringing highly innovative medicines to patients. But we also have to do a better job of ensuring that we're bringing drugs like Eliquis to market, which save the healthcare system money. For every 100,000 patients on Eliquis, we estimate we save the the healthcare system $5 billion. We've got to place a high bar on the medicines we bring to patients and stick by that as an industry. All right. Well, I, and I appreciate that. And I do, health is so precious to people that they'll pay almost anything if it's serious. So that in a funny way, sometimes we see increasing costs based on that calculus of how much money are we avoiding, which I think can be a false pathway sometimes. But certainly, as a user of Eloquist, um, uh, and grateful, recognizing what the old system was and how better Elquis is, I, I, I salute that. Uh, the, the higher cost in other, or the lower cost in other countries, you've all answered that. I understand there's some price setting there. But I think the solution, I mean, we're paying double. Even when you take out the, the PBMs and the uh, list price from the, from the net price, we're, we're paying double what, what Europe or Canada or Australia are paying and, and somehow that's got to be a negotiation that the rest of the world probably has to pay more, and, and you guys are going to have to figure out a way to do that. And I'm not saying it's easy, um, but it, it's one of those things. I want to, it's one of those things we have to address as a, as a, as a country and as an industry. Um, I want to ask, earlier there was some uh, mention of river blindness, of, of issues in, in uh, underserved countries. I want to see if each of you have a, just a quick example of something where, your company has gone in there, um, obviously we've heard about Merck, but the, uh, and done something in a country like that where it really was philanthropic. Thank you, thank you. We dedicate uh, billions of dollars every year to three diseases uh, that are, do not have a, an economic counterpart. For example, uh, one of the diseases that we have contributed to its uh, treatment and eradication is intestinal worms. You know, we donate billions of pills every year in order to treat intestinal worms. We have programs to support frontline healthcare workers in the developing world that have supported more than a million frontline healthcare workers. And we develop a medicine 
for multidrug resistant tuberculosis, which is widely used in every single protocol in which we are not enforcing our patents as we speak. Right. So we, we've made significant contributions. It's impressive, but we, most people don't know about that stuff. Uh, uh, Mr. Davis. Well, you mentioned the Mechazan donation where we yeah, gave 4.6 billion. I would add another one we did, you know, recently. Uh, we, we were very focused on COVID now. We forget about Ebola and the, the, the scourge of Ebola that hit in 2014, 2016 in, in Western Africa. We actually, uh, at, no pro at no profit to us, developed an Ebola vaccine, have distributed that, continue to distribute that drug to, to address that devastating disease. Uh, Mr. Burr? Uh, Senator, we had, as I referenced, a, a large presence in HIV. In, I'm incredibly proud that in the late 90s, our foundation worked with governments and local communities to set up the core infrastructure to deliver HIV medicines to sub-Saharan Africa, focusing on children. The president of Botswana recently congratulated the, the or thanked the BMS Foundation for saving a generation from, his, from extinction, his words. We are now leveraging that same infrastructure, partnering with Baylor College of Medicine Thanks. to reverse something in childhood cancer. Bernard, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry that his time has expired. Apologize. Anyway, thank you all, and I think those stories need to get out. But we also have to solve this right. issue of the, of the price disparities. Senator King. Thank you. Since I have seven minutes, I'm going to do two minutes to celebrate innovation and then five minutes to go after this, the cost question. On the innovation um, side, there's an article that came out in Health Affairs uh, Journal in September of 2020, and I'd like to put it in the record, Contributions of Public Health, Pharmaceuticals, and Other Medical Care to U.S. Life Expectancy Changes, 1990 to 2015. And the article looked at the fact that between 1990 and 2015, life expectancy in the U.S. increased by 3.3 years. And the authors of the researchers and authors of the study were able to say 44% of that increase was because of public health measures. 35% of the increase was attributable to pharmaceutical innovation, and 13% of the increase was attributable to other improvements in medical care, with 7% unknown. But the fact that pharmaceuticals led to nearly more than a third of that increase in life expectancy is something that we need to acknowledge as a context to this discussion. And a Virginia example, Mr. Davis, you'll know this example very well. In Elkton, Virginia, there's a plant that produces Gardasil, which your company developed and began to market in the mid-2000s, 2006, 2007. And it is a, it is a vaccine against a virus, the HPV virus, that create, that leads to a lot of cancers, especially cervical cancer and others as well. And that's just been revolutionary in terms of cervical cancer. The, the, we were one of the first states to put a vaccine mandate in place for HPV vaccine. Um, and cervical cancer among vaccinated populations has dropped 70 plus percent just in the last 15 years. I mean, it's truly remarkable, and I've been to that plant, and I know how proud people are to work there and believe that they've been at the vanguard of a revolution that has helped so many Americans, but people all around the world. So that's the good side. Okay, now we got to get to the reality for the hearing, which is people here still pay too much out of pocket. Together with my colleagues here who voted for the Inflation Reduction Act, we, we said for a long time that we ought to be negotiating on prescription drug prices, and, and we did it. And it passed by only one vote in the Senate. So each of us who voted for it, we were the deciding vote. Um, and I know not everybody likes that, but it's, it's working. Um, we, we put the cap, the out-of-pocket cost cap on seniors under Medicare. We did the $35 insulin for seniors under Medicare. And, and thank goodness that sent such a strong market signal that many of the companies that were reducing insulin cost to $35 a month said, we'll just do it for not just Medicare patients, but others. And they wouldn't have done that had we not taken that step in the IRA. Um, but, but there is more that we can do. And I really want to focus on one thing because I think it's just right before us. Um, this committee took strong bipartisan action about nine months ago on this PBM reform bill that is sitting on the floor of the Senate right now. And I don't expect you to be the masters of all the details of that bill, but if we were to pass a meaningful PBM reform bill, and much of the conversation today has been about this weird difference between list prices and, and actual net prices, if we were able to pass a meaningful PBM reform bill, 
what would that do to the cost that um, American patients are paying out of pocket for pharmaceuticals? Please, and I'll ask each of you to address that, Mr. Duano. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, and thank you for recognizing the value for patients of pharmaceutical innovation. If we were able to pass meaningful reform, meaning a reform that would uh, delink the uh, revenues of the PBMs and insurance companies from the lease price, and that would pass rebates and discounts to the patients, I would anticipate two things. One, it would affect lease prices. Two, it would significantly reduce the out-of-pocket cost for the patient. So I welcome the bipartisan efforts of this committee to go through PBM reform. It's a linchpin of lowering the cost for patients. Mr. Davis. Yes, you know, I also believe that the provisions that are in the bill, at least uh, some of the big ones around transparency and also delinking, are definitely steps in the right direction. I think we need them. They're a lot of what we've all been focusing on in our testimony and in the question and answers. And I do think it, will, it can benefit patients if we move in that direction. So I'm very supportive of what you're trying to do. Mr. Berner. Senator, if we could do that and we could reduce the significant amount that we are paying in rebates to intermediaries who are not passing those rebates on to lower out-of-pocket costs, speaking on behalf of Bristol-Myers Squibb, we could work almost immediately to begin to bring down list prices, and I would welcome the opportunity to work with this committee to do that. Well, I know that in, in conversations with the chair, the intent is to move on that bill pretty soon, potentially with some other health items as well. And I think that the, the opportunity is right before us. The bill passed out of committee overwhelmingly bipartisan. I think it was an 18 to 3 vote. And that tells us that we would have some amendment on the floor. The delinking provision was not in the bill. The, the, the chair and ranking were supportive of the concept. But at the time we marked it up, the CBO hadn't given us a score. And so we agreed that we would wait on that until we got uh, on the floor. But the CBO has now scored the delinking bill that Senators Marshall, Capito, Braun, and I, uh, and Tester have co-sponsored. And the CBO says that it would save about $650 million over 10 years. And that's in addition to the savings for patients. So I know we would try, hopefully, on the floor to add that in. Um, the, the, my, my colleagues have all talked about the reality of what they hear from constituents, and I hear the same thing. And I know, I think the complexity of the system and the, the, the fact that list price is different than net price and the fact that we have re rebates, quote, rebates that never show up in people's pockets. And then you have programs to try to assist folks who can't afford medicines, but they have a six-page application form and, and both a sticker price might scare them off or a six-page application might share them off. We just have to simplify this and cut out a lot of the middlemen in this instance. I, I'm, I'm, I've long said to the chair that I'm very concerned about PBMs because we might fight with you about whether you're researching enough or should your research be more than your stock buybacks. PBMs aren't doing a single bit of research. They're not producing a single product. And yet they seem to me to be the ones that are scooping up the most of money that's just sloshing through the system right now. So I hope we can address that soon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Luan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to everyone who's, who's here today. Uh, biosimilar competition is one way to drive down drug costs for patients and increase access. Would you all agree with that? Yes. 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 Appreciate that. Now, one of the concerns I have is we often see competition stifled in this particular area with biosimilars. And the concern that I have is tactics and delay that lead to entry of the lower cost biosimilar drugs keep patients from often having a, a choice, but also being able to afford their prescription drugs. Now, Mr. Davis, yes or no, will you commit to not blocking other drug makers from entering the market when the primary patent on Keytruda expires? Well, Senator um, and Merck, and we, we do believe that biosimilar competition and generic competition is core to the system. We need the patent protection, and then we need a robust biosimilar and generic market. And I can tell you that um, when the composition of matter patents expire uh, on, uh, on our drug, Keytruda, I fully expect, and I will not try to stop, a biosimilar IV version of Keytruda coming onto the marketplace. Is that a yes? That's a yes. I appreciate that. Mr. 
burn or yes or no, will you commit to not blocking other drug makers from entering the market when your primary patent on Eloquist expires? Senator, we have um, a number of patents on Eloquist, and we have um, certainly anticipated that when the patents that are most relevant for that product expire, we will have generic competition, in this case not biosimilar, but generic competition, um, and that would be around 2028. When the primary patent expires on Eloquist, will you commit to not blocking other drug makers from entering the market? Senator, I, I don't, I'm not a patent attorney, so I'm not entirely... You're the CEO. <laughs> Senator, I would, I would say that when the most important, most relevant patents expire on Eloquist, we will welcome generic competition. So is that a yes or a no? That's a yes, Senator. Mr. Boehner, I have the same question on Obdivo. Yes or no, will you commit to not blocking other drug makers from entering the market when your primary patent expires? When, when the most relevant patents for Obdivo expire, we would fully expect biosimilars to enter the market. So yes. your answer is yes when the words you're using are relevant patents, not the primary patent. Is that a clarification that I can... Yes, Senator, I'm just not certain exactly what the most, um, what, what you're referring to as the primary patent, but th when we, when those patents expire, we welcome generic competition. First patent, primary, the initial one, the one that was filed when you, when you got this drug done. Look, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a CEO, I don't work at all. If I'm not using the wrong words, please help me a little bit. You know what I'm talking about here. Yeah, when the compos generally it's when the composition of matter patent expires. That it is doesn't sound like welcome. a yes. I, I hear what you're saying, I, I, I'm going to move on. Mr. Duato, we know that J&J &J entered into settlement agreements to delay the launch of some Stellara biosimilars in 2025. This will prevent competition in the drug market and Medicare negotiation the way I read it. Will you commit to lowering the price of Stellara in 2025? <laughs> Senator, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I anticipate that the price of Estelara will actually uh, be lower in 2025 as it has been, l been lowering during the past decade. The price of Estelara has been steadily declining the net prices and I anticipate that the biosimilars in 2025 will further uh, decrease the price of Estelara. Are you answering yes to my question? Yes. I appreciate that. Now, we've heard over and over that Medicare drug pricing negotiations will kill innovation. Um, Mr. Berner, I want to get a few things clear. Yes or no, is it BMS's position as stated in its lawsuit against the Health and Human Services that, quote, the IRA's real victim is innovation and, in turn, the millions of patients who are counting on the pharmaceutical industry to develop new therapies will save lives and improve health and well-being? Senator, we have serious concerns about elements of IRA, um, specifically the, the, the fact that this isn't an actual negotiation. Um, we obviously like some elements of IRA, notably the out-of-pocket costs. But the, I appreciate uh, the, that, but the, do you stand by this statement that was filed in the lawsuit to um, the United States Health and Human Services Department? We have very serious concerns about the implication of IRA. Do you on, stand by on, this statement? Yes, sir. Yes or no, is it also true that you said in your Q4 earnings call, quote, we see a legacy portfolio of well-established products facing headwinds such as IRA. Through this portfolio, or though this portfolio is declining, it is expected to continue to generate strong cash flows to enable investment in our future growth drivers. Do you stand by that? Yes, we, we actually have a legacy product portfolio that will continue to provide the necessary funds to innovate um, and bring the next wave of innovation to market. Yes, sir. So based on that, can I interpret that cash flows were generated even though the IRA went to place and they're sufficient to support new innovations as was reported to the investors? Senator, we don't yet have IRA having been fully implemented negotiation. The, that process is ongoing. But we, we are generating cash flows off of our existing products to fund innovation, sir. The, the statement in the same filing to Health and Human Services with that case said, this portfolio, though the portfolio is declining, it is expected to continue to generate strong cash flows to enable investment in our future growth drivers. So it's, it, is it generating cash? 
our legacy portfolio of products is continuing to generate cash. Yes, sir. So even in the face of IRA, you're generating cash? Again, Senator, we, we haven't actually finished negotiation yet on our first drug, which is... I'll, I'll move on. I, I appreciate that very much. This is one of the... I grew up on a small farm in northern New Mexico. When a cow does its business in the barn, there's a pile of stuff I've got to go clean. That's what it is. It's manure. It has other, a lot of other, other languages. But that's what it is. I don't understand why this is so complex. The people in the room make these darn things so complex so no one understands them. I'm beside myself, Mr. Chairman, that when a question was asked, can you break down where the money goes on this particular drug? The answer is, well, it's complicated. I, we don't know. I'm, I'm hoping it's included in the filings for investors that people know where the money, well, I'll follow up with more questions. I have several, Mr. Chairman, but y'all help me and other laymen across the country and around the world to be able to understand what the heck is going on. Um, you all have some good lawyers. Maybe one day I'll go to law school and try to get a gig with one of you all. I don't know, but this is just frustrating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Markey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, research is medicine's field of dreams from which we harvest the findings that give hope to families that uh, a cure can be found for the disease which has been running through their family's history. That's what it's all about. That's what we all hope for. That's what I represent in Boston in Kendall Square, two miles from my house. And I've been for 47 years in Congress trying to help that industry to be able to grow and to be able to um, get the resources from NIH, other resources to make the breakthroughs, to give hope to ordinary families. Um, like my father who drove a truck for the Hood Milk Company. And the companies have done great work over the years, but that funding, which I was on the health committee in the, in the House for 36 and a half years. And I fought very hard for NIH funding. And those NIH dollars delivered results. For example, between 2010 and 2016, every drug approved by the FDA was in some way based on biomedical research funded by the NIH. Uh, and my father, the truck driver, at the Hood Milk Company, one mile from Kendall Square, he paid his taxes to make sure that the funding would go to NIH so that the research could be made in order to make the breakthroughs uh, that would help him and help his families. Um, and Merck's former president, and you've already quoted him, Mr. Davis, he said, we never try to forget that medicine is for the people, you know, my father. It is not for the profits. And Merck's website states that this philosophy is embraced by their leaders and the employees to this day. So FDA approved the cancer drug Keytruda in 2014 based on NIH research that my father helped to pay for as a truck driver at the Hood Milk Company. And last year, the list price was $191 thousand dollars for this cancer drug that helps patients with lung cancer and other cancers, $191,000 a year. Uh, and the annual meeting and proxy statement 2023 um, says that it brought in $21 billion in revenue for the company, and it was driving key growth for Merck's business. And at the same time, Patients are also straining under insurance premiums, struggling to afford this drug, taking on debt, or skipping treatments altogether. So Merck has now filed 168 patents on this cancer drug, Keytruda. Uh, and as we know from this earlier discussion, you know, when we discuss this, we can be talking about primary patents or secondary patents. And what I heard earlier was that the witnesses in general just want all the secondary pat patents to also be exhausted. Now, to a very large extent, of course, 168 patents then bring at least 168 lawyers into the room. You know, how do we use this patent 
in order to thwart another smaller company, hundreds of smaller companies from now making the breakthroughs that advance even further, the breakthroughs. Innovating, discovering. 168 new patents extend further using lawyers, you know, the time at which there can be a lower price drug made available to people so that they can get the treatment which they need for lung cancer. So, yeah, we believe in competition. And we really believe in, Mass in competition in Massachusetts. We believe in Darwinian paranoia inducing competition. But when there's a monopoly on a drug, which is the key drug, there is no competition. There is no paranoia. If 168 patents just extend and extend the ability to have new companies, smaller companies, smarter new scientists to make the new additional breakthroughs. And that's the play. We understand the play. That's how lawyers get into it, not scientists. You keep the lawyers keep the smarter new 25-year-old out with the new insight, just by extending and extending. So I do believe in research. Um, Adam Smith hated monopolies. It was the number one thing he hated the most, monopolies. And so in in this particular instance, my father died from lung cancer. And my father uh, um, was, drove a truck. So the list price for Keytruda is more than his entire pension. That's what he got from the Hood Milk Company. So one year of his entire pension would have paid for one year. And he died from lung cancer. And I don't think that Judge Merck really intended that, that that would be what the result of research ultimately did. So, Mr. Davis, um, would it have been consistent with Judge Merck's philosophy to take research funded by my father's tax dollars to invent a life-saving lung cancer drug, charge him hundreds of thousands of dollars of his hard-earned retirement for it, manipulate the market, using patent law to block out competition that could have brought in new scientists that could have improved it and lowered the cost. Uh, and as a result, the costs are unaffordable. And then use the income you got from him to brag to your investors about the drug as a key growth area for your business. Do you think that's what Josh Merck intended uh, when he had that high-minded philosophy, which he uh, used to describe Merck's... Um, In 17 uh, seconds. <laughs> Are you looking for the answer now? Yes. Okay. Well, I would say uh, the quote was, medicine is for the patients, not for the profits. But so long, so long as we've remembered that, the profits have always followed. And what he was capturing was if you focus on bringing new medicines to benefit patients today and make sure you have an investment and a return to bring me medicines for the future, which we are a biopharmaceutical research company, research is who we are, innovation is the lifeblood of our company, then we can deliver for the mission to the patients. And I can tell you at Merck, and I'm very proud of this, we always put patients at the center. And okay. we always look at ways to do that and that will continue to be what we do. So I do think, actually, what we're doing is consistent because it allows us to be sustainable for the long term okay. to deliver for patients into the future. I just Thank think, you very much. I just uh, think uh, it's turned into medicine for the shareholders and not medicine for the okay. people like my father. Uh, let me, that's the last uh, line of questioning. Just let me thank uh, our three panelists for being here today uh, and all the senators who participated. We're now going to uh, turn to our second panel. Thank you all very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you.
you all very much for being here. Um, we have three very knowledgeable guests, panelists uh, on prescription drugs and pricing. Our first witness will be Peter uh, Mayberduk, uh, who is the director of Access to Medicines Program at Public Citizens. He's a lawyer was advocated for stronger price regulation and stronger public health protections in patent law in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, Mr. McBurdick, thanks very much for being with us. Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, members of the committee, thank you. Public Citizen is a national public interest organization. We have 500,000 members and supporters, and for 50 years, we've advocated with success for health and consumer protections. Drug prices are high because of monopoly power, leading to the rationing of treatment and preventable suffering. One in three Americans has failed to take medicine as prescribed due to cost. Like Lois Chisholm of Fort Worth, who tells us of Merck's diabetes drug, I need Genuvia to control my blood sugar, but I can't afford it while on Social Security. Or Robert Cherevano of Loveland, Colorado, and his wife, both trying to afford Jane J's Zarelto, why do we have to pay so much? We are 90 and 81 on Social Security. Does anyone care about the elderly? Keith Clyburn, Lafayette, Louisiana. I'm paying for Eliquis and other pricey meds from BMS. So what do I do? I ration them so that I can eat and pay rent. Patients for Affordable Drugs has compiled 34,000 such stories from people struggling to afford their medicine. And that's a tiny fraction, a mere sample of the heartbreaking problems out there. High prices cost people their health. They can cost lives. They force impossible family budget decisions. We all pay for high prices, whether we are patients or not, whether out of pocket or through higher insurance premiums and wasted tax dollars. Medicare and Medicaid spent nearly $200 billion on prescription drugs last year. Americans pay the highest prices in the world, three times what other countries pay. That's net prices, not list, to the point of the last panel. We, three times more in net prices, the real prices. We also do the most to support research and development. The world's largest biomedical research funder is a public funder, the National Institutes of Health, and we should be very proud of it, contributing more than $45 billion a year and laying groundwork for many, if not most, new medicines. Plus, public support is now indispensable to the late-stage development of one in four drugs also. We the people drive innovation together. So, Americans first pay for the research, then contribute to the development, and then on top of it, when a drug comes to market, pay the highest prices in the world. Other countries broadly negotiate prices to protect their people. But here, pharma has accrued tremendous influence in our politics, spending hundreds of millions a year in lobbying, outranking every other industry. Now, our government provides patent protection and exclusivity on medicines. In theory, this should support innovation. But in practice, drug corporations write the rules, extending monopoly power, sometimes for decades, blocking competition far longer than this body intends. Senators, it is not a market in the way that you may believe, respectfully. The corporations testifying here today claim any price relief would compromise their ability to invest in new medicines. No. That framing erases the millions of Americans rationing treatment. It erases the tens of billions of dollars that taxpayers invest in R&D for real health priorities, and it erases the hundreds of billions of dollars that industry spends on self-enrichment. Last year, drug makers selected for Medicare negotiation spent $10 billion more on stock buybacks, dig dividends, and executive compensation than they spent on R&D. J&J and BMS each spent $3 billion more on these self-enriching activities. And over the prior decade, Merck's buybacks and dividends also exceed R&D by $3 billion. j and spent an impressive $43 billion more on buybacks and dividends than R&D over this period. Of course, drug makers do not set prices according to R&D costs. Instead, the price of a patented drug is simply the most that we, as a society, are willing to pay to care for our sick and loved ones. Where monopoly power blocks affordable alternatives, blocks market competition, and we have little choice. Today, perhaps for the first time, our country is making progress, challenging high prices and rationing, including through price negotiation and countering price spikes. And we commend the committee's attention to this problem. But the problem is getting worse, much worse, and more action is needed. 
We should negotiate prices from the moment a drug hits market, not wait a decade as we are today, which costs taxpayers tens of billions of dollars. We support legislation before your committee to strengthen market competition and transparency and accelerate generic entry. Ultimately, we will have to confront monopoly power. That is the rotten foundation allowing drug makers to project influence, to game the law, and keep prices high. Other real challenges, including providing patient assistance and challenging middlemen who take advantage, real problems, but these flow inevitably from the patent monopolies that make it so lucrative and so easy to rip off patients. We can, we must do better for health, for access to medicines. Thank you for your time. Please count us with you in this fight. Thank you. Our next witness will be Tahir Amin, CEO, Initiative for Medicines, Access and Knowledge, a nonprofit organization working to address inequalities in how medicines are developed and distributed. Thanks very much for being with us. Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and members of the committee, it is my honor to be invited here to share with you a root cause of why the U.S. pays by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. That root cause is how the pharmaceutical industry manipulates the patent system to lengthen patent protection and its market monopoly in order to block competition, all while increasing prices. So I qualified as a UK uh, attorney in intellectual property, and I've uh, been in the field for 30 years. I spent my first decade of my legal career practicing as an at attorney at international law firms and for multinational companies, including American companies. Through this work, I learned both the legal and business side of intellectual property and its importance to inventors, investors, and companies. I also learned how to use loopholes to gain the system. These loopholes enabled me to invent intellectual property rights so companies could obtain and maintain a monopoly in the market while continuing to extract maximum profits. It was the reason why I co-founded iMac and left the commercial world. America is in a severe drug pricing crisis. More than one third of Americans say they are not able to fill a prescription for medication because of its cost. Black Americans are most heavily impacted as they are more likely to require medication for chronic conditions and earn less. Now, prescription drug spending on retail and non-retail drugs is po uh, poised to grow 63% this decade to $917 billion. And branded prescription drugs, which are under patent protection, account for 84% of that spending. These price hikes correspond with a dramatic increase in patenting activity in the pharmaceutical sector. Now, we have analyzed some of the top 10 selling drugs in the United States, and we have found a total of 1,429 patent applications have been filed as of 2022. 741 patents have been granted on these drugs. On average, that is more than 140 patent applications filed per drug and 74 patents granted per drug. That's 66% of those patents are filed after the drug is approved by the FDA. Now, if we look at some of the drugs that are on the discussion today with the companies that were here, K. Truders, Merck, Eloquis, Stellara, Johnson & Johnson, also in Brovica, which is AbbVie, Johnson & Johnson, between them there's a combined of 494 patent applications filed on them, of which 235 were, were granted patents. I just want to dig a little bit deeper into Merck and particularly Senator Lewan's questioning of whether Merck would uh, uh, sort of allow biosimilar competition uh, once the primary patent expires. You have to remember, Keytruda actually represents 47% of Merck's total pharmaceutical revenue. Now, as of June 2002, we've counted 180 patent applications, of which 78 are granted. They have patent protection at least until 2039, which is in total 37 years of patent protection since they filed their first patent, which is 2002. You're supposed to get a patent for 20 years, remember. Market and media analysts are currently reporting that we should see biosimilar competition in 2028, to Senator Lawan's question. I put myself on record here today, we will not see biosimilar competition until 2034. They will litigate the hell out of it, and they will use every cent that they can to kind of not leave $100 billion on the table, which is what those patents are worth to them. And all this talk of R&D and, you know, new indications, these patents are already disclosed in their earlier patents that should be expiring in 2024. Bristol-Myers Squibb, same problem. Bristol-Myers has actually increased the price of Eloquis 
uh, by 124% since its induction in 2012. That's higher than the general rate of inflation. They have filed more patents here in the United States, 2.4 more times than in Europe. In fact, the patents that uh, the uh, CEO from BMS was talking about, the relevant patents, those were actually invalidated in Europe, and that's why we have generic competition in Europe. But those patents are actually preventing competition here in the United States, and it's going to cost us $48 billion in branded eloquence. So this committee should recognize that the use of patent tickets to extend the market monopoly period on a product is not a case of a few bad actors. It's endemic. If you want to get to the heart of the problem, the first and most important thing Congress can do is solve the problem, is raise the bar for what classifies as an invention that deserves a patent. It's an enormous monopoly power that should, uh, that in, in the single hands of a drug maker, and we shouldn't leave it to the market and litigation to resolve these issues. So the patenting activity goes well beyond time, the time limits of monopoly that the Constitution required. Lawyers uh, exploit sophisticated legal marketing Jedi tricks that they use under the guise of innovation. We need to actually not get uh, sidetracked by this innovation talk. Most of these patents are tweaks deliberately for the financialization of profits. And that's what the pharmaceutical industry does today. I've been in the business, and I know what it's about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Cassidy. Pleasure to introduce our, our witness, uh, Darius Lakdawala, currently the Quintiles Chair in Pharmaceutical Development and Regulatory Innovation at the uh, University of Southern California Mann School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Scientists, Sciences. He also serves as Director of Research for the USC Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics, a partnership between the Mann School and the USC Price School of Public Policy. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Chicago and is a renowned researcher and thought leader in health economics and health policy, which obviously impacts us today. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and honorable members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about drug prices and the assessment of medical technologies. My name is Darius Lakdawala. I'm an economist and a professor at the USC Mann School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences and USC Price School of Public Policy. I'm also the director of research at the USC Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics. The opinions I offer today are my own and don't represent the views of the University of Southern California or the USC Schaefer Center. I'd like to start with a story in December of 1984, a young boy from Indiana named Ryan White was diagnosed with AIDS, a result of a transfusion with infected blood. In the immediate wake of his passing in 1990, Congress passed the Ryan White Care Act, ensuring affordable care for HIV AIDS patients. The value of this program was fully realized five years later when highly active antiretroviral therapy emerged as a life-saving treatment for patients with HIV. Today, nine out of 10 patients receiving care through the Ryan White program enjoy viral loads so low that they're no longer infectious. Thanks to breakthrough medical innovation and to forward-thinking public policy that made innovative HIV therapies affordable to many, HIV-positive patients can now expect to live well into their 70s and beyond. But increasing patient access through bold expansion of affordable care means little when there are no valuable cures or treatments to access and breakthrough medical therapies provide little value if high cost sharing pushes them out of patients' reach. This is the fundamental trade-off we're here to address today. This trade-off between innovation and affordability has played out in different approaches taken across the globe. There's little doubt that U.S. consumers access newer drugs sooner and more often than their overseas counterparts, and this increased access to the latest treatments matters. Schaefer Center research suggests that introducing European-style pricing policies would ultimately reduce innovation and cost American consumers just over half a year of life expectancy, about what would be lost if all American surgeons suddenly forgot how to perform heart bypass surgery. Yet there's no denying the sentiment that U.S. consumers unfairly pay higher drug prices than their peers overseas. The deteriorating accessibility of prescription drugs in recent years threatens to derail the access advantages and health gains American consumers have so far enjoyed and is one component of this growing sentiment. Even patients with good insurance are struggling to access the therapies their doctors prescribe. Plans frequently employ coinsurance requirements and utilization management tools that severely restrict access. These changes likely harm health since the link between increasing out-of-pocket costs and worse patient adherence is well established. Surprisingly, coverage has deteriorated even while the average manufacturer net prices of brand drugs, the amount manufacturers receive after rebates and discounts, have declined in each of the last five years. 
Schaefer research analyzing the flow of money spent on insulin found that while net prices fell by 31 percent, total expenditures remained nearly constant because intermediaries were pocketing the additional rebates and price concessions instead of passing them on to consumers. Transparency in pricing throughout the pharmaceutical distribution system would be a major step towards ensuring that drug prices reflect the actual value provided to patients and don't simply enrich intermediaries. Rewarding drugs that do provide value promotes investment in the right kind of therapies and ensures good health will be increasingly within the reach of American patients for generations to come. Decades of economic research demonstrate that where innovators predict higher returns, innovative effort and discovery follow. Outside the U.S., many countries adopt pricing approaches that either fail to measure value to patients or make it hard to predict future returns to innovation. The U.K., Australia, and Canada employ relatively transparent and predictable methods that nonetheless rely on quality-adjusted life years, which discriminate against vulnerable patients. On the other hand, France and Germany avoid qualies and focus on rating clinical benefits in a way that often fails to correspond to the eventual price. These trade-offs also underscore the risks of so-called reference pricing approaches that would tie American prices to those charged by other countries. In so doing, Americans would be forced to live with the vagaries of pricing systems designed and implemented elsewhere around priorities that may differ from ours. Ultimately, the right policies for American patients need to focus on the affordability of good health. Affordable and generous health insurance, transparent and predictable pricing, and an emphasis on value to patients provide the ingredients for a better approach that secures the health of American families now and for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me start the questioning uh, by saying that I've heard some of my Republican colleagues talk about free market capitalism. Uh, Mr. Maberduck, uh, isn't the entire pharmaceutical industry based on government-granted monopoly power. And Mr. Amir, you may, uh, you may want to also speak to that. What does that have to do with free market capitalism if the government is guaranteeing uh, monopoly for many, many years? Well, precisely, Senator. Um, prices are high because drug makers have monopolies over products we can't just Substitute a patient can't just say, "I'll take, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take uh, this alternative." The, the patents block them from having uh, affordable access. So that is a monopoly, uh, not a market system. American taxpayers stand up the world's largest and most productive funder, a biomedical R and D at NIH, and it's we the people that found the risk that uh, we the people that support the risky early stage research that has led to such significant medical okay. breakthroughs in the areas of mRNA, uh, cancer, heart disease, gene therapy. But in other words, the government has played a very active role in the entire process, Mr. Mead. What yeah. about free market capitalism and monopoly? Well, I mean, it's, uh, the Constitution grants Congress the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts, securing for limited times a right to their inventions. What we have now is a system where the patent system is not a limited time, it's a monopoly that gets extended, extended, extended. And when we think about the free markets and the principles of capitalism, it's interesting Senator Paul mentioned Milton Friedman. In fact, the neoliberals actually didn't like monopoly power and they, they really did actually believe in the free market, but the fact that the intellectual property system patents has been corrupted by the, the modern pharmaceutical system to kind of extend those monopolies actually goes against the principles of free market. So, in a sense, they're not living up to the bargaining of the free market. Okay. Uh, Mr. Latuwala, what do you think about free market capitalism and government protection of monopolies? Thank you, Chairman. Well, truly free markets exist only on the whiteboard in my classroom at <laughs> USC, first of all. But it's also true that without patent protection, there would be no innovation. That's a result that's been known in economics for centuries. Um, so the real question is, how do we balance patent protection, which induces innovation, against the value of new innovations and being able to broadcast them more widely after the end of a patent? And that trade-off can be tricky, although in the case of pharmaceuticals, we have a useful instrument, which is health insurance, and that allows patients to access drugs at much lower prices than what manufacturers receive, even during the patent period. And that's an opportunity for us to ex expand 
accessibility even during the patent protection period. Thanks very much. All right, my last question for all three of you is I believe you all heard uh, the CEO's uh, testimony in response to questions. Um, what would you say uh, briefly about their responses? Uh, do they, in fact, effectively address the issue as to why we pay by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs and why one out of three people can't afford the medicine their doctors prescribe just? Sir. Well, Senator, we heard some wild stuff up here this morning, including a lot of blaming middlemen for the problem of high prices. Look, drug makers' high prices are the whole reason that we have a middlemen problem. It's because we have exceedingly high prices at the outset that there's an attractive market for middlemen to enter. But the fish rots from the head. If you break up the market, if you look at where the revenue is, drug makers capture two-thirds, $323 billion. Pharmacy benefit managers are a small slice, $23 uh, billion. So you can't fix the problem of the pharmaceutical industry by going off middlemen who are just trying to skim off the top. You have to get to the root of the problem, which is the monopoly power. What's that mean? I agree with what Peter says, and I would just add that uh, some of the answers that the uh, CEOs gave, for example, the Merck CEO about uh, allowing biosimilar competition in uh, when their primary patents are I believe that is not going to happen. I think if you look at all the patents that they've stacked up, they know what their game plan is. You just have to look at what happened with Humira and Abvi. Similarly, uh, I, I believe you just look at what's happening with these weight loss drugs. We're looking at the patents on those now. These are potentially going to become $1 trillion drugs. Okay, Dr. Lakdula, Bala, pardon me for... No problem. No problem. Um, I think an important point that maybe is, is often missed is that net prices of pharmaceuticals have been falling for the past 10 years very consistently. CMS recently released its national health expenditure accounts data, and it confirms this fact as well. We have to reconcile that with rising costs for consumers, and so I think intermediaries are actually playing a bigger role than it might appear. About 40 cents of every dollar spent on pharmaceuticals goes to intermediaries, and unlike pharmaceutical firms, they're not engaging in innovation that ultimately improves health. Good. Thank you very much. Senator Cassidy. Thank you all. Um, Mr. Mibardak, um, I think it's made very persuasively. By the way, clearly patents are part of the free market system. It's the way that you protect intellectual property and you incent creativity. Now, whether it's being abused is another issue. And you mentioned the patent tickets, which is actually uh, legislation sponsored by John Cornyn to do away with them. So that's recognized. But I think uh, without protection of intellectual property, we would not have this innovation. Why would you? Why would you put the time into it? Let's just make that point. But, Mr. Mibardic, Dr. Lagdwala makes, I think, persuasive point that without the profit incentive, you will not get the innovation. Um, are you disputing that? I am not. So you're just kind of the degree of the profit taking, if you will. I'll point out, by the way, that the three examples you gave seem to be all Medicare patients, and there is legislation out there which will cap the out-of-pocket exposure to, uh, for a Medicare patients to these expensive drugs. I think it will be $2,000 in June of 2025, and the catastrophic portion is going away now. But, Dr. Lakdawala, uh, that said, somebody's paying. Yes, insurance is making it more affordable. Medicaid is making it more affordable. Medicare is making it more affordable. I could go down, but somebody is paying. In my state, I was recently told that pharmaceutical costs for the Medicaid program are now 35% of the total. Um, and so, um, yes, maybe we could do some value-based purchasing. That's a lot of money, though. That's a huge program. That's not hospitals and doctors. That's the pharmaceutical cost. Um, so I think Mr. Mabardic would say, listen, they've got enough profit to innovate. Um, what we're really talking about is more than the profit required to incent. Would you disagree with that? Well, I, I think the question is really how much, whether we want to decrease profits or not. And we know that whenever you decrease profits, you get less innovation. Um, and the research that we've done gets to exactly that question. If you were to reduce prices and profits, what would the net result be? You'd certainly save money, but you would also lead to fewer new drug discoveries and lower So are longevity. we at the sweet spot now, or could we do something to make drugs a little bit more affordable to the Medicaid program, for example? Because I'm looking at this gene therapy, and obviously how they're initially priced is only based upon the restraint of the company. But if you have a compelling gene therapy, they could almost name their price. 
and it's going to be very difficult for a Medicaid program not to cover. Uh, so, but this could bankrupt taxpayers. So thoughts on that? Yes, so I don't think we are at a spot where lowering prices makes us better off. But for gene therapies, I absolutely agree there's a significant problem. And the issue is that the prices are all paid up front when there's the most uncertainty about whether the gene therapy is going to work in the long run. Now, value-based purchasing could obviously play a role here. Um, but if you do value-based purchasing, you still have a – how do you negotiate the upfront cost? I come up with a drug for uh, gene therapy for a sickle cell. I treated a lot of sicklers. You want to treat them, and you charge $20 million a person. Um, I can't believe they would get that, but, but you see, the only thing that would stop them from asking that may be the sticker shock. So how do you negotiate that first out of the gate price? Because I think that's a kind of a question that's kind of hanging out there. And you're the free market guy, so I'd like your opinion. On the whiteboard, yes, that's You're the true. Whiteboard guy. It's, it's actually not the case that you should negotiate the actual price up front. Instead, a value-based price would mean that the price will respond over time. So f imagine a situation where gene therapies were paid for in installments. In the I, size I get of that. And believe me, I've written about that in stat, in stat, if you ever wish to dig up something out of stat behind a paywall. Uh, but it still means that if you've got an initial high price, no matter what your value-based purchasing arrangement is, it could still be something which society could not afford. Uh, what do you think of the German model? Uh, Dr. Baker, I think, came up with that, in which there is, uh, you know, you can ask whatever price you want for the first two years, but then after that, there's going to be some sort of negotiation based upon real-world data. Yeah, I think the, the challenge with the German model is it's actually very hard to predict the outcomes, that if you look at the ratings that the Germans um, produce of the benefits of drugs, they're not well correlated with negotiated prices. So if I'm an innovator trying to figure out what I'm going to get paid in Germany, it's really hard. And if you can't predict your returns, then they're not going to work as financial incentives. Okay. Mr. Amin, have you had a chance to evaluate the bill that's working its way through Judiciary Committee and might be included in a year-end package as to its effectiveness in addressing uh, patent tickets? Yeah, push your button, ma'am. Senator Blumenthal and uh, Conan? Yes. Bill? I think it will potentially cap for biologics uh, uh, patents that can be enforced to about 20. Uh, I've actually uh, uh, given some technical advice on that bill. I don't think it's going to resolve the problem. You don't think it's going to resolve the problem? No. Uh, I see. Uh, okay. Well, thank you all. Very thoughtful. All right. Thank you all. Very good discussion. Appreciate you being here. That is the end of our hearing today, and I want to thank all of our witnesses for the participation. For any senators who wish to ask additional questions, questions for the record will be due in 10 business days, February 23rd at 5 p.m. Finally, I ask unanimous consent to enter the record three statements from stakeholder groups and experts about the cost of prescription drugs. With that, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you.
Yeah. Really, like, compared to just, you know, sort of, like, you know, so, you know, so, you know, so, you know, so, 